Go Light presents the Talking Bollocks podcast. The hip knocker. Episode 64 of the Talking Bollocks podcast brought to you by Go Loud, the home of Irish podcast. It's me, Harry Flower. It's me, CLB. And this week we're joined by... Des Bishop. Happy to be here on number 64. It's funny how podcasts for some reason feel the need to count their episodes. Well, it's like a thing. Oh yeah, why did we do that? But like, what if one, I don't know, bastard? No, no, it's not. It's mm. Listen, it's not a problem. It's just, it's funny. Podcasts tend to do that, you know? They yeah. tend to number their apps. But, like, yeah. everything is numbered now. Like, you get season three, episode four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, listen, it's great, but you guys aren't doing the season. It's just that normal radio shows don't go like this yeah. is our 1,000th, you know, 2,000th episode. We're not a normal radio show. You are not. Hey, listen, I'm I'm, I'm a fan. I am I love you guys. Yeah. Yes, Des, love that, mate. How's things? How but you? listen, when I say I'm a fan, let All me right. just say that what I really mean is I'm really happy for what you guys have done, <laughs> you know? I've never listened to an episode. I, I, yeah, like, I just, I just, I, 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 I like what you are, and I like that you've managed to take it to the masses, you know? Yeah. That was scummy. No way, well, yeah, but you're under, you're... You're from marginalized communities, but you're underrepresented in the mainstream media. So I'm glad that you've gone via the untraditional route and actually gone out there into the mainstream. Are you sure you've never listened to an episode of this podcast before? Because there's a mad echo in here. Or <laughs> I don't fucking need to listen to it because I know where you are coming from. No, I mean, I, I, I know. what. I just love that you've done it. That's what I'm saying. I'm yeah. proud of you, even though I've, I only met you today. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. DJ only meet us as well because we met you about an hour and a half ago, but we were late setting up. Oh, yeah, which is, it's important to say because we've literally been chatting for an hour and 15 minutes and now we're finally recording. Yeah. Yeah, but we weren't chatting about things that we wanted to chat about because you kept nipping it in the bud. Yeah. Well, no, because I didn't want us to blow our load. You know, I wanted us to, to hold the, the conversation so that they were fresh and real and not regurgitated. Yeah, we literally sat in there and we're like, right, so is there anything that we'll definitely not talk about on the podcast that we can actually talk about now for the sake of having a conversation? And we talk some shit in there. Yeah, and now all the listeners are going to be like, we want to know what you were saying in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'll never find out. Trust me. Right, we did a thing called Zingers Days, yeah? All right, we start with the Zingers. All right, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to break the ice, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, right, break yeah. it. Jocks off. Right. Would you rather be in a coma for five years or in prison for ten? I, oh, in prison for ten? It was a year on your fucking Instagram. No, it was 10. No, it was 10. Was it 10? Yeah. yeah, yeah so definitely. in a coma for five, a prison for 10? Yeah. yeah. That's easy. Coma for five all day. Yeah. Why is it easy? Because you'd be fresh. A five-year <laughs> kip, that is. Yeah. We've just fucking two years of nearly a coma in the fucking pandemic. No, I mean, listen, <laughs> I, I've I, I've never been in prison, but I've done work in prison. And uh, I just, I just don't, I don't want to be in there for 10 years. You, you know? a good friend of ours in prison. Oh yeah, okay. he he said he was in prison on this podcast, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I met it's Willa funny. originally when I was doing some stuff. <laughs> uh, I, no, because I, I don't want to. You know, I don't want to be. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, Willa sacked in the morning. Uh, then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, no. But uh, anyway, I've done. But anyway, uh, but I also did a lot of stuff in the main jail. That was in the training unit. But for years, every Wednesday, I used to go up to the main jail. And uh, nah, bro, I'm I'm good. And you know, like, cause like, I'm. A, I, I'm a recover, you know. I'm a, I'm a. I've been clean and serene since 1995. But I feel like if I was in prison, I'd be like nothing fucking else to do. And yeah. I don't, you know, I'm fucking dirty needles. And, you know, like I, I just, I don't want to be in prison for ten years. I'd rather be in a coma for five. Prison right. is fresh over here, though. Have you been in prison? No, no, no. Right, I f like I have. I know people who was in prison. And like, I have an Xbox, telly. Yeah, but then you want. But you're out in five years. Yeah. A coma, mobile years. phone. It smells like somebody else's hole. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you still have a phone, don't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but you're still locked I'm up. I'm good. You have to fucking. You have to sex on a fucking. You know, you get all these old burner tiny Nokia phone. You have to sex on a Nokia. <laughs> it's hard to sex on a Nokia. You yeah. know what I mean? But that's what I'm saying. You're locked up, though. You know what I mean? After five years, nah. is this, you ever go to sleep? You close your eyes. You open them again. It's bleak. Boom. Six hours later. Five years feels like Boom. a day. Yeah. <laughs> and you're fresh. Yeah, who, who's staying in prison for 10 years? I didn't anyways, yeah. Really? Yeah, I did, yeah. What were you concerned about your coma? What were you but concerned about? wake up and someone's brown bread. But you know you're not guaranteed to get out when someone dies when you're in prison. I think you would for the media. Oh, do you, do you think you prefer to come out of a coma and find out that somebody you love is dead or prefer to be in prison and not be able to get out for their funeral and have to fucking so you're grieve? You're not guaranteed you to get out. Properly then. You're not guaranteed to get out though in prison. That's, yeah. prison, that's, my, that's my main concern Is someone in media family dies while, I, while I'm in a coma And I wake up And everyone's like Yeah like your brother died Four years ago I'm like ah hell what But if you know You can grieve 
Do you get me? No? Yeah, but like, it's still, you're in prison for another seven years. No, it's a valid point. Though, yeah, I, I mean, I don't understand why you're giving like more time to the prison. I feel like that question is, that question I feel like is maybe more of a more of a 50-50 if it's like one year in prison or five years in a coma. Because yeah. who the hell is going to pick 10 years? I, I, what's wrong with you? I don't know how you're picking 10 years. I don't, you know, I don't know what you think is going to be great in fucking prison. It's like, you're going to do 10 years. What if nobody dies? Then you wasted fucking 10 years. That was the big, yo, that was the big debate. <laughs> All right. So we're saying we had if no one dies, I'm going to be fuming in them first five years. You get me? Yeah. <laughs> There's a strong chance someone's going to die. Hopefully not. someone dies. Yeah, yeah. You're pretty young. You're pretty young, though, to be that concerned about death. That I'm saying so 10 years and the joy is fresh for me there's like you're out, still only a pup well, I'm not five saying years is less prison. five years you come out of your coma you know you shake it off you no. do two comas and then you get out yeah, yeah. you find out that way. man United still shit the results there's yeah 67% of people are rather the coma and 33% 33% that was a few thousand that's high for me that, that, that's in my assumption is that it's higher than I would have expected yeah yeah. Right, but that's the result, yeah? <laughs> See when someone's baldy up there. Mm hmm What you call that? Oh, I saw that, and I didn't know any of the words that you said. I just say bald spot. Oh, really? oh but bigger than a spot is. You know what I mean? That's Bald patch. Yeah. Yeah. I say bald spot or bald patch. But you don't have another term, but it's just a bald I patch. I personally don't, but I saw that on your Instagram, and I, I was like, I didn't, I was not familiar with these words. That yeah. you said. <laughs> right, right. What is like Widow's Peak or something? No, no. An egg in the nest. An egg in the nest. Wid Widow's Peak? I don't, I don't even know what that is. I that know sounds like a holiday spot. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going to summer? Widow's Peak, yeah? Good festival on down there. <laughs> egg in the nest, 45%. Peno spot, 54%. Peno spot? Yeah. yeah. Oh, right. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah, a good one. Yeah. 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 A lot of people were saying solar panel. Oh, there was a few crackers. Uh, I can't sunroof. Even think of yeah, sunroof. I think I've heard people Never mention heard that of before. That. Uh, Pope's hat. Huh? Oh, the Pope's hat. Oh, that's right. the one. That's yeah. a cracker. Of I thought that was a good one as well. Uh, the next one. See if you're in a gaff party with the boys. Uh -huh. Would you rather be shaved off your eyebrows or your hair? Oh, my hair. I, I shaved my head for like a decade and a half. This is what I was trying to explain to him. He, he can't get his head around this. Yeah, you look fucking... Down. You get your head shaved, you look cool. You, know, no. you get your eyebrows shaved, somebody's like, who shaved your fucking eyebrows? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you look, like, you know, you're like, are you getting married? Like, they assume you've had, like, a fucking stag night or something. Yeah, no. You shave your hair, man, you look fucking fresh. Man, I'm from the 90s. David Beckham shaved his head. We all shaved our head for fucking four years. <laughs> yeah. 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 So what was the results on that? 54% the head, 46% What? Head. Really? <laughs> that, that's that's is shocking. Pretty oh, but you know what, though? Actually, I can understand that because it depends on the person. See, for me, it's like a no-brainer because like, I have thick hair, shave my head, it grows back quick. But I guess some people are very into the way they look. So they think, I'll shave off my eyebrows, they'll grow back pretty quick. No, but you know what the thing is? We, I think, not we, you, uh, who, who was last week? Oh, Brian Penny again, yeah. So you and Brian underestimate how long it takes your hair to grow back because see when we got a skin fed and it grows back in the stubble, for that to grow into a comb of it would take months. Right, listen. Oh, yeah, but I've been there, but that's but I don't mind having a shaved head, though. That's the thing. The head in your hair definitely goes quicker, grows quicker than your eyebrows. Yeah, but you don't have to grow that much in your eyebrows. To get to that again would probably take Your eyebrows months. are very thick. You yeah, but now here's the question. Better won't, right. So go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you're, I was cutting across you, actually. Yeah. Please, you go. <laughs> we have a bet on, right, since the start. And oh, I, yeah, so we can count then. Yeah, so this yeah. is what I'm saying. So everyone keeps bringing her up. Like We address it every few weeks. Yeah, I don't know why people keep not... bringing her back up. But we bet at the start of the season, whoever finishes higher, El United and Liverpool, the other have to shave their head. So, yeah, oh. I'm basically conceding now anyways, right? But... When I shave my head, we'll see. You know what I mean? Yeah, it won't, yeah, yeah. It won't take that long. So how long do you reckon? Because I did it a couple of years ago. Oh, I'd say, I'm going to say, but to get to that exact haircut now, like around that length, I'm going to say probably f four months. Oh, no, no I think it's way. six months. No. But yeah. this, yeah, not, Calvin. not a chance, lad. Tell I you promise bro. it. I promise it, right? So I got my haircut before. It was 2019, I think, in the summer. I got it done. And I was getting a cut nearly every two weeks to keep it at that length. You had to get it had to get a faded nearly every week and then I had a tennis ball for about a month and then on the fifth or sixth week you had enough nearly to get a haircut. Now let me ask you this. Mm. What number is the did, did you pick a number for the shave? Tree. Where a tree? So that's hardly a shave. No, it is. Because I got it done before. But I'm saying if you got a one come. Oh, so you're saying you're gonna shave it with a three? Yeah. Ash, come I, I'll do it for him. Will I do it on the podcast? Don't do it on the podcast. I think well, we'll do it as a video. You will definitely do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, shaved yeah. my head in the middle of In the Name of the Father. I shaved it with a zero. Why did you do it in the middle of the, in the Name I, of the Father? Because I always shave my head anyway. 
It's but just why kid, did you pick in the oh, middle of that? Oh, because the kids did it for a laugh. You know, mm. I was living in the house with right. the family, so they did it for a laugh. Right, but like, I, I used to get like a one or a two all over anyway. Mm. Yeah. So, I, a three will grow back pretty fast. I'd look weird with a body hat, boys. I'm getting rid of the eyebrows anyway for the singer. Now, listen, if you got your eyebrows done and they were taking time to grow back, would you put... Would you paint them on? Would you tend to? Probably. That'd That's, be funny. So if this, I could, but see, I've read, how would you deal with this? This is why would you would you paint, would you, would you, would you put on like fake eyebrows? Or would you just do like what women do with the like paint the pencil? Crawling. See, I think the girls. So the, this is why I was, I was shocked by the results because it's so close. But then I realized a lot of them who voted are women. Yeah, true. And they were saying ah, stuff like... right, you didn't gender it. Yeah. No. They were like, oh, oh we have no women, of course, anyway. Yeah. That should have just been yeah. for guys. That yeah. yeah. Only yeah. because it's just too much for... Like, I I, I mean, I, I don't want to get into any arguments about, you know, whether it's sexist to say this, but I think it's a bigger deal for a woman to shave her head than a oh, guy. Yeah, definitely. Oh, well, obviously, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Common so sense. I, I, I would have left I would have left the women out of that question. Right. So that's why it's so close. But so it's good, it's good singers, man. Yeah. yeah, do you like them ones? Yeah, it's great. I feel the ice is broken. <laughs> Not quite. Have you got a singer? Before? So, Des, do you have any singers? No, I mean, I, I, I didn't. I didn't know I was going to have to come up with a singer. Yeah. So I didn't. I didn't come prepared. We should have told you. Yeah. We should have well, told you. We'll take the rap uh, on that one. Yeah. But there's one that we always go to as well. That people always give us fucking load of shit about. If you don't ask the guests, do you piss in the shower? Oh yeah. Yeah. I, well, I don't yeah. understand how. You know, I, 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 like for a long time I thought that might be controversial. But like, why would you not? And, and my fiance pisses in the shower. Fair play to her. Yeah. She's, she's really. Why wouldn't you? The way I look at it is. We're wasting so much water in the world. Like, it saves a flush. He's That's what I say. Yeah, <laughs> it saves a flush. There's, we're saying this. Have you pissed in the sink? There's I a ha- zinger for you. I have done. Like, I, oh, now yeah. I don't. Now, I'm a little taller than you guys, it. so sometimes I get a little tempted with a sink piss. And then people are like, that's fucking disgusting. And I understand this is controversial. This might be a talking point. Mm. But and, and I, I understand you think it's disgusting, but it really isn't. It's just mentally in your mind. Yeah. It's just, you're rinsing that. Like, there's loads of shit coming off your face, too. Yeah. But I, I'm not saying I do it all the time. I have, I have done it. So did you do it, like, while the toilet was free? I'm you know, really jammed myself up even bringing this yeah, up, no, but you did. Yeah. I'm just saying that sometimes I just lazily because then you know I don't have to flush and I don't have to bend over and yeah. lift up the seed. Yeah, and you're you know? washing your hands anyway. So <laughs> yeah. Well, there we are. Um, yeah, it's good content, man. That's all I yeah. care about. <laughs> Clickbait. There's Bishop yeah, pisses yeah. in his own sink. Yeah. yeah. Zinger. Yeah. Have you got one? I don't Another know zinger. Did yeah, well, well, we have to do this week's ones now. Oh. And then the results will be on next week's one with someone else. Oh, sorry. I didn't, I, Did you get me? I, I didn't realize we were doing the results show. Yeah, yeah. well, you're learning there. You're learning. Strictly yeah. come dancing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm very I don't know if we did it. Would you rather, because I remember we did TV shows or film again, yeah? Yeah. Would you rather not look at telly again, like films or TV shows, or listen to music? So never watch Ant or never listen to Ant. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh. Very good. That's a good That's a good Does zing. podcast count? Yeah. yeah. Uh, any any audio? Oh, no, 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 it doesn't. It doesn't. So podcast music. counts as music. Oh, never listen to music, you're saying? Yeah, music. Yeah. Oh, so music. no songs ever again. So I've... That's a toughie, man. That's a good zing. That's a conundrum. Oh, it's an easy oh. one for me. I'll never watch telly. Uh, really? Mm. But th- th- I have to be honest. I watch, more, I watch more visual stuff than I listen to music. Mm. I watch more stuff than I listen to music. Mm. So I think... I think Hmm. Oh, that's a toughie. Oh, I'm stumped. Football's involved in telly, isn't it? There you go, bro. Welcome, welcome to the real conundrum. Yeah, but you could uh. you could listen to it. You could <laughs> listen to a match. I like listening to a match when I'm driving. That's childish, Des. Mm. Wow, I have to, that's a toughie, man. That's a toughie. Mm. I just love tough. getting into a good. I love getting lost in a good series. You know. Yeah, I can't actually answer yeah. that one. Oh, that's a toughie, man. It's like that, boys. Yeah, that was a good one. That's a good zinger, bro. Yeah, right, mm-hmm. you right. Know? That's my zinger anyways. Let me know what you think. Out what? Sunday on the polls. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. so we don't have to answer, right? We nah. just, you can answer now. Yeah, yeah, no, no, way. but I'm, yeah, I'm saying right now it's a tough yeah. one to answer. Yeah. I mean, my initial reaction is I'm going to go, I'll never listen to music again. But then you think about but, it. But it's very sad, though. To me, that's very sad to have to, have lo- to, have to lose that. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, you have one. Um... And I don't know where this came from because we were bombarded this week. So something must have happened in the last right? few days. Can I just say one more thing before you go to that zinger? Yeah. I apologize because I, I don't want to go back on something. This will happen what, out there and you were slagging me No, but that. what happens to music <laughs> on, the, on the stuff that you're watching? Zilch. Oh, so suddenly the, the, the music is, is wiped out I'm of television? I'm messing, I'm messing now. It costs the music. Oh, well, then I'm definitely going to go video. I'm going to go visual because I'm still going to get music on the shows. You get your dose in there. Yeah, so sorry. Go ahead. My apologies. 
Right? Right. <laughs> See, we don't usually get this deep with singers. You know? no. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, I, I, I have to say, I get a real kick out of this. No, because I, I, I like the analysis of it. Yeah, no, it's good. I enjoy it myself. But it's usually like when the, when we say the singer, it's usually your mind is made up really quick. And you're like, no, I picked this bum. But then you never usually have to think about it. Yeah. Well, that was a heavy one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know what happened this week, but I'm seeing it everywhere. And I get messages everywhere. And I've seen a few people do it on Instagram as well. But do you think there's more doors in the world or wheels? Easy one. Easiest thing I ever. I more know doors or wheels? Doors or wheels? Yeah. There's mo- obviously more doors. What obviously. do you mean obviously? Because what is wheels? Are we it. saying cars? No, every no. car has like two or four doors as well. Right. So there's and cars. Then oh, oh, nice, bro. I didn't even think about that. See, right, so <laughs> think that what about trucks that have eighteen wheels? So them Ooh. trucks only have two doors, but they have eighteen wheels. You're at the wreck of my head. What about oh. bikes? How many bikes is there out there? They don't have doors, and they all have two wheels. Yeah. How many, How many shopping trolleys? How many, hang on, how many planes is there out there? Planes have about six or seven doors on them and they have about 24 wheels. Wow. But how mean? many houses? Yeah. How then, many How many, push yeah, how many doors in a house, though, bro? How many push How many doors in a house? Stabilizers. <laughs> We're not all from the flats. Well, you We're going... not all from the flats. A lot of houses have a lot of doors. Yeah, well, the flats have a lot of doors <laughs> as well. No, that, no, now that you're at the point that I never thought about it like that, it's definitely... A good zinger now. A good zinger. But I definitely Very hard to think prove. Doors. Yeah. You well, never will prove it. I mean, I was initially going to go with wheels, personally. I but. still think it's wheels. Trolleys is a good one. Really? Wheelchairs. Prams. But you yeah. need to remember, so you're talking... Unicycles. <laughs> Tro- <laughs> Unicycles. Do you know what I mean? That's the least amount of wheels per It doesn't matter. Per it's still a wheel. Every wheel counts. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's the a new wheels. campaign, man. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, everything that has, like, the four wheels and all this carry on, right? Every house has a bell. What, six, eight doors, ten doors? Every house. Yeah. Bar none. So. Chairs have wheels on them. There's not that many 18 wheeler trucks. There's a lot, though. There's there's a, there's a, but there's more houses with yeah. like ten doors. Yeah, but not every house and has I'd doors. Say, you know what I mean? I'd say think, about all the toys, more. think about all the toys that have wheels on them. Bro, push bikes, stabilizers. Yeah. Some bikes have four wheels on them, that case. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, my head's wrecked. Some yeah. cars only have two doors with four wheels and then a spare one in the boot. Five. Many mansions, boys. Many, imagine how many doors is in a mansion. Well, yeah, oh, 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 yeah, okay. Oh, 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 oh. What about bed sits? They're what all about all land. the skyscra- uh, skyscrapers? Yeah. Their windows, I'm not changing doors, the doors. Not I'm doors. changing the doors, bro. No way. I'm changing lads. the I'm not doors. I'm <laughs> changing the doors. What's, what's a lift? That's a door, lift door. That's a no, door right you can't there. Count that as a door. It opens out. No, Wait, it's a door. There, the elevator yeah, door. I, don't, the lift. What, what bro, do you call? Them. What do you call the things that close <laughs> on an elevator, on a lift? Cones. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Come here, listen. What I do you call them? The elevator door. The, the yeah, lift door. Lift yeah, door. no, I get it, but I'm still going. Yeah, but I'm, like, I'm going. I'm going doors. What pulls up a lift then? At the top, in the mechanism, there's wheels. Boom. Boom. There you go. No, valid point. Valid point. But come here. I like this till the cows come home. We're not going to be able to prove it. Yeah, we can't but it's a that. very good, it's a great thing to think You'd about. You'd be surprised who listens the to this evolution, podcast. Someone, someone's the evolution, the, 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 the progression, even in this short time, has been very enlightening for me. I'm, I'm quite shocked, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> what you're trying to say is, we came across as two stupid cunts, but we're actually Yo, very bro, intellectual. That is what I like to call your own issues. Because actually, <laughs> I was just saying that I'm very impressed with how much I didn't think about immediately that you brought up that made me think about it. We look after you, Des. Yeah, don't it's very, I love this stuff. You? I like crossword. The, all this stuff, these little brain teasers, I think it's great. Yeah, it's good. Keep shit. I, I think they're less zingers I think they're more like you know brain fucks or you know yeah. whatever they used to be zingers now we've just moved into a home yeah world I think I like it. it's a little brain tease you know yeah, yeah. it's a nice ice break up with the guests mm. you know what I mean it gets, gets a go gets it going but we were well broke we, our ice was well broken well yeah. broken yeah. melted yeah. gone yeah global warming yeah. Uh, right something we want to talk about we have a couple of suggestions but there's one that me and Terence have uh, you've been holding on to yeah, well, it's kind of reared its ugly head again. So me and Terrence had this oh. discussion probably about a year ago. It was more of like a debate that we had. And it reared its ugly head over the weekend. And it was the Whitney Houston one. Bro. Right, now listen to this. This is a big one. So Million Dollar Bill by Whitney Houston. You know that song? Uh, how does that go? And if he makes you feel like a million dollar <laughs> bill, say, oh, oh, say, <laughs> oh, oh. Make you go left, right, up. Down, make it spin and round and round. Say, I, I, oh, I gotta be honest, oh, I, I'm say, quite familiar oh, with her, but I don't really know that song. Right, good, so my the whole good, argument put is one hand in the air. Say, so yeah. this, this is what we'd be stuck with if you couldn't play music anymore. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> think Basically. about it. Yeah. So the whole 
the whole question is, I said to Calvin, million dollars. very, dollar, very controversial, I think. I don't think so. <laughs> I think I don't think million dollar bill is in Whitney Houston's top ten songs. It's definitely not. I never heard of it. Yeah. So Do you, you know ten Whitney Houston songs? Though? No, I don't know ten. No, 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 it does though. So if it I doesn't. play, 10, but I bet you if you sang ten other ones, I'd actually heard. yeah. Um, if I play 10 other Whitney Houston songs, you would say straight away, it's like you're born and grand listening to them, yeah. you know, all mm. the lyrics. But that is like one of our more upbeat songs. It's a good song, don't get me wrong, but it's not top 10. I think it's top 10. I know, but 10 is a, 10 is a large list. That's it what is. I would that say. That is a large list. And my argument to him is always, right, so you have to name, if it's not in the top you 10, you have 10. to name 10 better. Right. And well, I think you fairness, got to like six off the bat, and I was like, right, I won't argue with you, but then I you struggle. Then. You struggle. I never then showed the other ones though that. Yeah, but, like, that, oh, but can you name just, Yeah, because but 10 is a long list. I mean, honestly, if you think about if you think about a lot of artists, even like the most prolific artists, it, like it's hard to have 10 hits. Yeah. And it's certainly hard to reel off 10 n names of songs. I know, yeah. but that's a bold statement to make. I, I just, and I think even. Why some, is this rare to ugly head? Because it, we, we had an argument about it before. In the car, yeah. remember? We had an argument about this before, and then it went quiet. And then we had another argument about it again yeah. with someone else. And then just... Well, what was the resolution? I mean, you, you put we, this We out named 10 songs. We had to name them, and then we had to like debate them, really. It was like, this one, I was like, yeah, that's grand. And he's like, this one's like, not a chance. And then you just, yeah. So somebody out there, do this thing for me, yes. Yeah? So I want to find out. So see her singles. I bet you that's not in our top ten most selling singles of all of them. Do you get me? Is it in I the top ten list on Spotify? I'm gonna look um, I don't know. I don't know. Number one, what greatest love is number one, right? Yeah. Well, there's a few. There's a few belters in there. Yeah. Like a few of them are really sad. No, I know the boys aren't listening. And but that little. Go on, we'll sing it. Always love you. I'm not. I'm not a singer, man. I'm not. I'm that not wasn't bad. That I'll give you that. But that that would be in my top five for sure. Our biggest Billboard hits, yeah. I believe that What's Billboard you on the It's the it's the chart that they base off. It's a big chart in the US. Yeah, yeah, that's the Billboard charts. That's the top. That's the top ten. Wait. That's the charts. Is it there? No, because you have to sign up the Billboard. But if you're my it. age, but when you think of um, I believe. So somebody do that for us then. Well, come on. Yeah, I know that's a great song as well. No, I know, but you always think of of coming to America though as as well, because Sexual Chocolate sings that. I huh? believe that children are the few. Oh, do they? Yeah, he sings it. Yeah, teach them well and let them lead the way. But so that's I, her whole song. That's her song, but he sings it in uh, uh, yeah. America. Eddie Murphy sings it in Come. Yeah, I've um, never seen it. I don't think that's a good basis though for it because there's some some songs no, out there that elders that underperform. I'm not based on does your audience. Was... Does your audience give a shit about Whitney? No. I'm quite they shocked that you you've 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 taken such a strong position. I love her. I love her the bits. Oh, you ah, love she her. She is lethal. Huh? No, she's lethal, man. Yeah, but I'm just shocked that you would. Choose this controversy. Yeah, because it popped up the other day when we were driving. And I was like, we actually, I'm going to talk about this on uh, the next episode. And now here we are. <laughs> and here we are. He said, I'm I mean, I remember the first time I saw her, she came out on some award show or some TV show. And I just remember thinking like, my God, that's the nicest voice I've ever heard in my life. Like, it was just a distinct moment of just being like, wow, she is incredible. She's like eight years mm. old or something. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, but that's not what I'm based off. It's just personal opinion. Yeah. And then I'm like, but I bet you then. That's another fact. I bet yeah. that's not. But oh, I actually want to know how many people agree with it, though. Yeah, because yeah, I think we've... that's a very, very controversial thing. So can we do a zinger now with this? Oh, oh yeah, it's million can. dollar bill in, in our top ten. Yeah, that's yeah, all, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Is that a zinger? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just a, it's yeah, gonna that's be a poll. On that's Sunday. a good poll. Yeah, it's a good poll. Three zingers there for the weekend for Sunday. Yeah, boom. And he's not scientific though, because some people know they know that you're divided. So they might just pick the position based on their affinity with you. Possibly, or else if you are affiliated with Whitney Houston and you do think million dollar bill is a belter. And in the top 10, you doesn't matter what your... Uh, yeah. Now, before you start, well, boy is listen, listen to, to 10 songs or 20 or something or 15. And 11. then, George, yeah, 11. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's more than 10. Yeah. Right now, I have a serious topic to talk about now. Oh, Jesus. For sake. And so it was a suggestion, and it, it is a bit fitting as well. So we had our first live show on Friday. And oh, congrats, guys. Thanks very much. Very thank impressive. You. It was a bit overwhelming. Uh, it, it was weird, though, because it's like, I knew it was going to go that way, that it did. We blew it out of the park, and then it was still at the same time. It was a bit surreal to say, like, how the fuck is this happening? So, somebody asked us to talk about uh, imposter syndrome, and I still think we have that. And Explain like, that again. So it's when you don't believe that you should be where you are, you know, like that. Ah, yeah. So you know, that, that. Some, that somehow it's a fluke. Yeah. You know. Well, I don't think it's a fluke, but I just am baffled how interested people are. So it's like your opening line at the live show was, we don't sing, 
We don't tell no. jokes. We have no talent. But yet we're at the shell in this place, you know, just to listen to us talking. Mm. And I just think that that's a mad one. Like, it's not like as if... I don't know how to explain. Yeah, I just like... Even at it, I'm looking out and the place is packed out and I'm saying, this is mad. These are here just to hear us talking. But it was legal. <laughs> yeah, but I mean... Well, first of all... I mean, imposter syndrome, is a, uh, imposter syndrome is a real thing. I've always had it. Still mm. have it to this day. You know, you, you think it's a fluke or like some bit of poxy luck has got you like a following. But at the same time, the proof is in the pudding. They're sitting there. They're not just, by the way, they didn't just come to see you, but they fucking love you guys. You're mm. walking out there. They're like standing up. Like I, I literally, at, at my most popular... 41 nights in Vicar Street. They never fucking stood up when I walked out. <laughs> but that's the connection that you make on the podcast because you're going deeper. I actually think that you're, the podcast, the speaking is a deeper connection. So what you're actually experiencing is not just why the fuck are they there. You're actually like coming to terms with the fact that like you're making a very deep connection with people through this medium, which yeah. is fucking great, which is yeah. the great thing about the evolution of entertainment is that now two fucking scumbags <laughs> from the inner city can can get that you know can put it out there yeah. and the and the other deeper part of that is they were dying for it for decades they were dying for that yeah. and yeah. they never got the chance mm. and now they get the chance because of the freedom of podcasting so actually just to heal your imposter syndrome it's not just uh that you guys are really entertaining and that they love you you're actually part of a movement and mm. that's just evidence of it right there yeah, I don't know. There's, I'm really like I, I really suffer with this subconsciously. I got, I do be lying at home and I need things to be affirmed to me. Like at the start, remember at the very start, and when we only like two, three episodes in, and we were fucking booming. But then if I seen someone else who started the podcast, I'd be like, "Oh, Terence, we're gone. We're gone. They're gonna do well better than us. They are." And like they've fallen off. Like no one, anyone who kind of started around then never came really to where we went to. And then I'd see people with like. Real equipment and all, like we're fucking talking into a mobile phone. I was like, "Oh, Terence, they have microphones. We're fucked. <laughs> they're gonna be, they're gonna be better than us. That's it. Like no one's gonna want to listen to us anymore." Yeah, and I but still think that fucking now, now, like, do you know what I mean? We have live, live shows selling out rain as people are fucking falling over themselves to get the tickets, and I still think the carpet's gonna be pulled out from underneath us. Like I think someone, I'm just waiting for the day someone's gonna, gonna be like, "Ah, you found out now, you little chancer." And I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, your car is well done. Like, you know See, I, mean? I would have never thought like that because I always knew there was a niche. Yeah. So no matter who was starting with us, there was nobody from our area starting, do you get me? Mm. So I knew mm. there was that niche in the market for two inner city lads or two working class lads to do a podcast, like, if that makes sense. So I, I wasn't worried about that, but I was definitely thinking, like, definitely what you were saying about the phone situation. As we used to do it into a phone in our man's kitchen, and then people have put up, episode one of our podcast is coming out now, and... There's a whole studio. Oh, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, like, like, but the thing is that you guys have, like, a chemistry. There's just... Listen, nobody knows the formula. Mm -hmm. you, the one thing you may have got lucky about, you know, imposter syndrome, the one thing you may have got lucky with is that you guys connected and mm. that your connection is special. Mm. I mean, a lot of it comes from that, you know? Yeah. But chemistry, like, good pairings, Ant and Deck, different groups over the years, that's luck. Mm. But the reality is that when it kicks off, that's not luck. Yeah. Mm. It's, it, it, you believe in destiny or not, but like it's meant to be. The chemistry is real. The fact that you met might have been luck, but the mm. chemistry isn't luck. The chemistry is real. Mm. Yeah. That's what people are tapping into. Yeah. And the fact that you guys bring the best out of each other, that, that, that's real too. Mm. You know? So, but imposter syndrome, to be honest, man, I think imposter syndrome is your friend. Yeah. Because you won't get fuck, you won't rest on your laurels. You'll always be trying to prove yourself. Yeah, that's look at how, fucking exactly Kanye. Watch saying. that Kanye doc. I'm no fan of what he's doing at the moment, but like those first two episodes of that Kanye doc, look at how much he's trying to prove himself. Now I yeah. know he ended up losing his humility. Yeah. But but the imposter part, this sense of like, do I belong here, is is a drive. So I I think it's good. Yeah. That's you know? exactly how I feel. This honestly. And listen, I don't buy this fucking. A lot of times I don't buy all this confidence nonsense. The word con, by the way, comes from confidence. You know what I mean? Con men. It comes from confidence. A con job is a confidence trick. That's what a con is. So a lot of people. I get it. Sometimes you need to be like, believe in yourself and all this Tony Robbins, you know, yeah. uh, uh, McGregor's always like, oh, he visualized this, you know, but like, that's also bullshit. It's like a trick. Yeah. The reality is that I think that the imposter syndrome is actually a, a better drive for success because you're always going to be trying to fucking yeah, prove to yourself. Prove yourself. Mm. You'll never settle yeah. and think mm. I'm never the settle, best. Man. Mm. It'll never be enough either. Mm. That's also the addiction thing, but maybe I don't know. I don't know your backstory enough. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> come in. I don't well, know. Look, 
Or just enjoying the ride, you know? No, nah, but it's great. But listen, you know, like self-esteem and different things that come up when you, you start to change as a human being and you feel like you don't belong, all that imposter syndrome stuff. It's really good, especially now you're putting it out there, you're being honest, because it'll force you to take a look at yourself. Because yeah. some of imposter syndrome is actually comes from negative things about yourself that might be torturing you. And you can heal those parts of yourself, but that's like a that's a journey in itself, you know? Yeah. I don't know. We'll see we'll see what happens about uh further down the road. But like for now, I don't know how I'm gonna I'll, I'll just cope with it. I'll just let roll with the punches, you know what I mean? Let but listen, every comedian listen, every comic, if they're on like a compilation show, mm. the guy that's on before them is fucking killing it. They're like, I'm fucked now. How like, you gonna everybody that? Yeah. goes through those feelings. That's just very normal, you know, to compare is to compete. But I bet you when you were on stage, and I bet you like right now when you're on the mic, you're not thinking about all of the other better podcasts. You're in the zone. It's happening. Yeah. Man. It's all in your head. It's all just stinking thinking, you mm. know? Yeah. But at the same time, I think it's a good motivator, you know? Yeah. No, well, it seems to be walking anyways. <laughs> not, like, you know what I mean? I don't know. But it's just the stuff that does be going on. See, when I, like when the lights go on, the, the mics are not recording anymore. This is what does be going through in my head. I'm like, bollocks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but some and, of that stuff is probably self-esteem shit too. Mm. You're getting older. You're getting success. It starts to, you know, makes you question yourself. Mm. So... While I was saying that imposter syndrome is a good thing because it's a driver, it is important to not be content with low self-esteem. Yeah. Like, it is good to tackle that. Yeah. So I know I'm, I may be contradicting myself a little bit, uh, but it is good to tackle your low self-esteem. It is yeah. good to realize that you do belong. Yes, That you yes. belong here. Mm. You know? Really? How does that make you feel? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that got my deep, I think. Yeah, yeah that well, got my deep. Have you ever done discussion. therapy? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, because that's like a, a moment of therapy. Like, you know, hmm. how does it feel to know that you belong here? I don't know. See, like, growing up, I always had a chip in my shoulder because you're always told you don't belong. Mm -hmm. And you're always like, anytime you make it somewhere, you shouldn't be there. And I guess it's on that line. I wanted to say that, but I didn't want to sound like that cunt that always brings her up. Yeah. But you reckon that that is just because it's instilled in us from young, like from where you're yeah. from, and it's conditioned into you. You're always told you're never going to make it anywhere. So when you're making it somewhere, you're like, I shouldn't be making it somewhere. Do you know, like that? If that's yeah, but that's why it's so much fucking sweeter. I think there, no, it is. That's some cunt mm. from Black Rock. Yeah, but doesn't the, get the same kudos for fucking that's making the thing it as well. It's like it's a rarity yeah. to have these voices on a platform, like on a big platform. Like so, like if you look at radio podcasts, and ninety nine percent of them are from middle and upper class backgrounds. Mm -hmm. That's just facts. Yeah, and that's so when we're here podcasts. now, yeah. So when we're here now, it's sort of like, should we be here? Like, because there was no one there before us, really. Yeah. Mm. So maybe that's... No, I get that. it, man. I think that that's real. And I think that's good to talk about, too, because that's, like, a, a part of not just imposter syndrome, not just self-esteem issues, but it's a it's a part about the difficulties of, of breaking out of class situations Stigmas. where perhaps your class would be holding you back. It's funny, because I remember saying to Damo years ago, because da Damo Dempsey, sorry, I only said Damo because we had been talking about him beforehand. Yeah. But I was talking to Damien Dempsey, and... He came up through this Irish singer-songwriter scene, which, uh, you know, other than him and uh, Glenn Hansard, who actually came from Badly Mun, uh, you know, a lot of it felt like perhaps it came from like a bit more of an educated, like just different kind of background. So I said to him, it must have been tough to feel like you belonged in a place where there wasn't many voices like yours. And he said, no, actually, they embraced me. The toughest part was going back to my fucking neighborhood yeah. and people telling me who the fuck do you think you are like fucking yeah. you're not fucking gonna make it doing that shit so actually he found the toughest part is people trying to bring him down mm. and you know so you also have that shit to yeah. to, to fight against you know? not from my close ones but like you definitely have that type of thing going on to where it's like don't get ahead of yourself now who do you yeah. think you are over there doing that and whatever that's why we purposely do things like when we were on all day and we purposely rock in the tracksuit just to be like we're working class lads like so we're gonna just prove that we're, we're sticking to our roots but that doesn't mean we always have to wear tracksuits so like like I was yeah. saying earlier on we wore suits to the live show and someone texted us and they were like don't wear suits stick to your roots it's like we wore tracksuits on all day because it was on a national yeah. yoke on a national level but we look fresh in the suit. We want yeah. to wear the suit. We want to look good. We want to feel good. As well, you don't want to make it look like you're trying to betray a character. Yeah, why not like, a oh, character? Look, you oh, you're authentic. Because you're, oh, no. no like, but I wear tracks because this is what I wear on a daily basis. Yeah, I'm comfortable in it. Yeah. I'm also comfortable in the suit, but I can't afford a suit for seven days a week. But as well, the suit was for the occasion. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, like that. you and then, wear track, that, that's the case we should be wearing tracksuits to weddings then. You know that's why I mean? people are saying, like, or like, but you went to Northern Day M in tracksuits, but that was like more so to be like, like, why would we got a suit to one Northern Day M? Half eight in the morning as well. Yeah, I'm not getting suit on decked out 
<laughs> yeah, but that's because you're being authentic to yourself. You're not yeah. playing a character. And yeah. to be honest with you, it's great on a on a deeper level because you're not just talking about being lads from the inner city. You're being lads from the inner city talking about loads of shit. Yeah. So you're actually reminding people that there's a lot more going on from the people that you completely dismissed. Oh, there's this podcast gets so deep all the time. Like, there's not a thing that we haven't talked about in terms of recovery, in terms of, I believe, mental health, everything. So, like, we are just two lads from the inner city and we do like talking about our area and bigging her up and whatever. But we, we also get down and dirty with everything. Yeah. But that was when I did join the hood all those years ago. One of the big motivations was. Most of the comedians are from middle class backgrounds. Most of the comedians don't sound like they're from, you know, inner city areas, you know, areas that are traditionally marginalized, right? Yeah. So I, I just wanted to get those voices out there. I, I didn't think like, oh, I'm a great guy or anything. I just I just thought there's so many funny people. There's gotta be one or two comedians coming from these areas. Mm, yeah. Most of them don't think that it that they could do it. In America, funnily enough, because there was so many successful African-American comics, a lot of people from, like, quote-unquote, the hood were thinking, I could do that. But in Ireland, there wasn't a lot. There was Brendan O'Carroll. Who else was there? You know, How back, long ago we back in the day. Then? like Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm saying. So, back in the, so that's why I wanted to get, the, get those voices out there. But it's yeah. coming from the same place that you are. And isn't it funny? Because Joy in the Hood was actually filmed in 2005. So what are we, 17 years since we filmed that? And you guys are still thinking that you haven't heard that many voices yeah. like you. Yeah. So but it's, you it, know, it it's not like that it. common. Yeah. So it's good that you're getting it out there. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. See, see, we're common amongst uncommon people. Yeah, but that's you're common as fuck, though, and you yeah. should never lose that. That's your, <laughs> well, that's you your point of difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I mean? I'm 28 years of age, it's going to be very hard to shake this now, wouldn't it? So. I never heard, you know, before I moved to Ireland, I never heard common as a term, like a, like a derogatory term. For yeah, it. common as muck. Yeah, I never, that, muck, that's yeah. all Irish. I, I, I wasn't familiar with that term until I came here. And yeah. Really? Well, there's that. Yeah. There's that well covered now. Well done, lads. That's, <laughs> that's imposter syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> So a little therapy <laughs> session. Yeah. Right. I think it's been a while since we, we kicked off or something deep like that. It was a suggestion anyway. So it was like, a good, you know it was that's a good, a good suggestion, one. yeah. Because we, it triggered me. It was like, oh, I actually have fucking got imposter syndrome. I yeah. talked about it with Brian last week. I think you you were having you were getting a coffee before we set up. And we had Brian Penny on last week. And he was talking about it. And I was like, oh, I suffer from that bad. And he goes, I suffer from it. And he was talking to Brezzy, you know, Brezzy. Mm-hmm. Brezzy says to Brian, don't worry, I suffer from it. Mm. And you're like, these people are in front Everybody. of lights and cameras and they're on stage fucking on a weekly basis. If they're suffering from it, it seems to be all right. But I just feel like, oh, like, yeah. No, oh, I forgot to, it. I, sorry, go ahead. Did you finish that? No, part? I finished, yeah. <laughs> I forgot to tell you that if you go on the internet and look in the comments... They will remind you that everything you think bad about yourself is correct. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, that's right. So we don't do that you anymore. You can't go in the comments. You got to stay out of the comments, yeah. man. Because the comments are like the people that try to bring demo down. Yeah. The, the comments are from people who would love to be. Well, no, not all. Okay. But a lot of the people would like to be doing what you're doing, so it's easy for them to tear you down because then they don't have to look at that part of themselves. You know what I mean? And that sounds corny, but it's so true. No, yeah. but it's true. But and, and and this is not a slight on those people because you have to have like more and more self awareness to understand what's going on. And none of us are perfect. We all do shitty things sometimes. We all think shitty things. We all act out sometimes in ways that are motivated from a negative place. So it's not like saying I'm better than that person. But one of the things that definitely motivates that behavior, if to want to tear you down, is because you're kicking off something in them. Yeah. You know. And yeah. trust me, well, years ago, one of the comments people always used to say was. Uh, He's not as funny as he thinks he is. You know, somebody would write that in the comments. Yeah. He's not as funny as he thinks he is. And I, always, I I would never write. I don't engage. But I would always think to myself, how funny do they think I think I am? Because in yeah. actual fact, I'm very fucking critical of myself. I guarantee yeah. you. I think I'm less funny than you fucking think I think I am. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Are we done with imposter syndrome? So, yeah. You're done with yeah. the heavy so, shit, yeah? Yeah. 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 Fuck's sake, up. man. Got deep, didn't it? Is. Yeah. yeah, give me. Can, when, is the five year coma still a fucking possibility? <laughs> <laughs> I need a fucking break from my head after this fucking podcast, man. <laughs> right, there's what we do with all of our guests, yeah? Yeah. We bring it right back to the start. All right. So, if you want to bring us right back to the start of your life, what's your name? Where'd it come from? And what was life like growing up? The beginning of Ready to Die. Yeah. So, uh, right, so my name's Des Bishop. Uh, known as an Irish American comedian, but I was born in London, which is established since we're being honest, which is very annoying to me because uh, my parents were just waiting for me to be born and then they left. But I'm stuck with this fucking British birth, which is like the original sin, like the bite of the fucking yeah. apple, yeah. the stain on my existence. Uh, <laughs> so I was born in November. My first Christmas was in New York. Like it was just- What date in November? November 12th. 
Oh, I'm just all dent. No way! Yeah, mate. What's the story? Scorpio. Have, Scorpios, yeah. bro. We're the best sign. I mean? Most controversial sign. Not that I'm a big sign yeah. guy. But I was born in 1975. <laughs> I'm 93. There you go. You know what yeah. I mean? D- different. There we are. So anyway, yeah, my parents went to New York straight away. Uh, grew up in Queens, New York, right? just normal ass neighborhood. You know, I actually I have a joke in my show at the moment, fun enough about class, which is that most all my professional career has been in Ireland. Most of my career has been in Ireland. Done very little shows in New York since my mom got sick late 2014. Doing a lot more shows in the states, and for the first time in my life, I get judged by my accent. Like obviously, like I've I, it's not the first time I've I've engaged with Americans, but it's the first time where for like long periods of time I've been like acting as a professional human being, and you know I forget that like. To Americans, my accent is literally the equivalent of, all right, what's the story? Yeah. Like, not, not full on, like, fucking, I don't know, yeah. you know, but it is definitely like a working class, like a, like a Beaumont, you know what I mean? Like, fucking common. Cabra. It's Cabra. common. It's common, bro. Yeah. And I would never try to explain that to Irish people that, like, you, you know, I, I had like a pretty, like, run of the mill, like, American kind of working class upbringing, but they hear that and they make, ju- you know, they make judgments about me, which is funny because, you know, when I come here, like, a lot of the people that I interact with aren't common. Yeah. <laughs> but when I go back, the guys I grew up with are common. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Somehow I went to Ireland and fucking jumped up a class. I don't yeah. know how the fuck, <laughs> I don't know how I fucking did that. But anyway, uh, so I grew up in that kind of like working class kind of New York, uh, but not, not, you know, pretty, pretty decent incomes though you know like yeah. america in the working day, class but new not like york poverty. in the 80s was definitely doing better than ireland in the 80s yeah. Come out, is queens not a kip no no queens are quite large i mean queens is bigger than the whole of dublin yeah so there's there's good bad parts you know there's like quite fancy bits we we grew up in a very normal mm. like there's just like you know any think of any area in dublin that's just like nice you know fucking Malahide. Full mount temple oak no no not malahide is too bad too nice, too nice. Is it, yeah? no Sorry. yeah no they're definitely not like the grace malahide. park road that's a nice hell straight up it's, yeah. it's even grace park road is actually too fancy for my upbringing i want to be more disrespect- collins avenue yeah yeah collins <laughs> avenue. Collins avenue, yeah. yeah i was mean disrespectful saying queens is a kid i just mean no. is it not like you know what i mean no no dude you will i will not get offended on this part yeah. so anyway uh queens uh kind of upbringing and then, you know, whatever. When I was 12, I, I started drinking a little bit too young. Uh, got a little too into the booze. At four, I had a lot of issues, self-esteem shit. Started acting out to the point where I flunked out of this uh, Catholic high school that I was at in New York. I got sent to Ireland to go to boarding school when I was 14. And that was the, the big change. Do I have to go through all this with no questions? No, because... I, I, a lot of your guests are older. Oh, like, I, like, I'm 46. I've got a long way to go here. We've had a, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I was thinking, so you just sort of breeze through that there. So oh, sorry. How do you get to the stage where you come to Ireland? Yeah, have you got family here? Yeah, so we were brought up, even though my mother was actually born in New York, my dad was uh, was actually, funnily enough, he was also born in England and then raised in Middleton County, Cork. So, but we were brought up very Irish. Not like Irish-American, like the annoying, like my great-great-great-great-grandfather was Irish. Mm. Watch that man's name, Conan. Conan. Yeah, we were much more like connected to Ireland than he was. First of all, I was in New York, and my dad's, all my dad's best friends were Irish. My grandmother was from West Cork. And so, you know, Ireland was like very much a part of our lives. We played Gaelic football. So we were very, very real Irish American, uh, even though Irish people don't accept us as Irish. We, we thought of ourselves as Irish growing up. So when this stuff kicked off, uh, you know, where I started getting in trouble and. You know, my, my mother was just freaking out. She caught me drunk a couple of times at 14. I'd already been drinking for two years, but she didn't know. So I got caught drunk a couple of times. And, you know, they're all sober people. You know, my parents are sober. And so she was just like, he's he's guaranteed to be, have a problem. So in a, in a moment of panic, well, actually, my cousin was visiting from Ireland, my cousin Fiona. And she was... Uh, just like out of the blue was like, why don't you go to boarding school in Ireland? And I was like, fucking cool. <laughs> so I actually said it to my parents, but my mother in a panic was like, yeah, and looked into it. And six weeks later, I was in Ireland. It wasn't like a life, you know, it wasn't like a plan that had been brewing up for years. Yeah. Mm. So when I was August 25th, 1990, I was on a plane on my own unaccompanied minor Aer Lingus flight. And I arrived, my cousins picked me up from Shannon Airport. I'd never met them. So they you went pick- to Cork? I went, no, I went, to we- I went to boarding school in Wexford, but they were from Waterford, my cousins. So I used to go to boarding school, Wexford, Monday to Friday, and then stay with my cousins at the weekend in Waterford. Right. So it was a Monday to Friday school, weekends in Waterford with my cousins who I just met, but obviously I got close with them. And, uh, and then I would go back to New York for the summer. Then what was school like? How did you find school over here? Well, whatever, man. It's, it's, it's so you don't bo- secondary school over here, basically. Yeah, yeah I, did my, I did the intercert. I did the last That's intercert. That's how long ago it was. I did the last one. 
The next What's year was the, the junior. The junior. The junior. That's the junior, isn't it? That's what yeah, used to yeah, call yeah. it. And then he changed it to 1990, the junior. 1991, yeah. 90 into 91. That's the last intercert. So I did the intercert, 1991, and uh, I was all right. You know, it was fucking, it was a rural, I was from Queens. Yeah. Suddenly I'm in like Wexford town. Most of the borders there were like farmers from Wexford, Wicklow, Kilkenny. You know, it was like not a fancy place. So it was kind of, it was weird. We still got the strap. Yeah. You know, coming from New York, I was like, I'm going to sue you, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you can't hit me, man. <laughs> and these fucking yeah. priests were like, get the fuck up those stairs. You know, it was a very, it was like, it was, it was a, a bit of a culture shock. That, But like, none of it bothered me. You know, like I, I had great friendships with those guys. You know, it was all boys. And to be honest, man, it kind of suited me. I was very easily distracted. And like the distractions diminished to a lot. You know, yeah. Suddenly I'm in fucking an Irish boarding school sleeping in these fucking smelly cubicles. And so it was it was a big life change for me, but it was the making of me. Now I have to say, like, I fucking I, I would definitely am a more successful person because of that experience. Yeah, you went to school with Amy's uncles. Yeah, you were saying that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all those kind of conversations make me uncomfortable. Like sometimes <laughs> some, some, sometimes I'll see some girls coming down the street, uh, I'll see that they clock me, you know, and I'll be like, oh, you still got it? And they'll come yeah. up and like, can we get a photo with you? And I'll be like, yeah, no problem. They'll be like, my ma fucking loves you. I'm like, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> That's fuck who I am man. now. Me ma loves you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but now he, he knew you were coming on, he told me to say hello, so... Me in laws and Wexford, do you know what I mean? To get them brownie points. Yeah, yes. well, I used to do a lot of, a lot of shifting down in Ross Lair back in the day. Oh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. you used to go around saying choir and all. Choir, it's choir good. Hate that's choir good, you know. Yeah, choir good. Going one. down Wexford, you know, with a strange accent. You know. It's a very good accent, yeah, very good impression. Know, fucking live there. Strawberries and all. Yeah, it's choir good. You know. Yeah. Well, don't get a rizzle. Get, get the yeah. chips and do it. Yeah, it's very good. But anyway, <laughs> very good. So I was down Wexford for like three years, you know, and playing hard and all that. like, And then. Uh, yeah, so then I, I did that, and then I went to college in Cork. Yeah, so talk us through that. Just bring oh, us through Jesus Christ, man, yeah. my life is too long. <laughs> I'm going to be exhausted. So skip the because, athletes. Because the thing about it is, what I knew about you was you're that American fella, comedian off the telly. I didn't know anything about this, like yeah. how you grew up. They actually oh, came right. from New York. I thought you bounced over here. Fucking lazy right. cunt. You could have just fucking Googled me. It's all on there. <laughs> it's no, all I'm, just kidding. I'm, just ki I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You know no, I mean? but I mean, I talked about it a lot back in the day, yeah. obviously, yeah. But, yeah, but I would have been in that piece of army. I yeah, thought you so. bounced over here when you were about 25. I'm like, I know, you know a lot of people I know thought... comedy. I'm going to Ireland. <laughs> I bounced over. I know a lot of people thought that, man. But, uh, you know, and, and listen, I, you know, funny enough, we're talking about imposter syndrome, but like, I can't deny that there was a certain advantage that I had in those early years of my comedy career because people were not, even though I would say it, they just couldn't fathom that this accent would know as much about Ireland. So even though I was educated here, people just kept seeing me as this guy that came here and knew a lot about Ireland. Yeah. You know, but like I, I started doing comedy when I was 21. So that was seven years already that I'd been in Ireland. But by the time I started blowing up big, I'd been in Ireland over 10 years. Like I literally was an Irish person, you know, like I'm an Irish person with an American accent, but for some reason they just heard my jokes differently. And they gave them, to be honest with you, they probably gave them more credit than they deserved. Yeah. You know, in that like, it wasn't that impressive that I could do a Dublin accent or a Cork accent. I've been here a long time. But they just saw it that way. But it was what it was. What could I do? I couldn't, I, you know, I couldn't stop them laughing. You know what I mean? Yeah. But yeah, so I, I went to boarding school for, for three years in Wexford. And to be honest, that final year in Wexford, that's when the booze really started to give me some problems. Because I used to like black out and get in a lot of fights. And I just started falling out with people and, you know, robbing shit, you know, for money. You know, like I just started doing bad stuff that like is promised if you have a problem with booze. I didn't have like access to money or whatever. So, uh... So um, I repeated my leaving in Black Rock College, which is like, it just oh, gives hello. me oh, very... There we go. I know. Yeah. It's like, I, I shouldn't even admit that to you guys, but we're yeah. having an honest podcast. Yes. Here. Mm. You need to know who I am. So my godfather, my father's best friend was Eamon Doran. I don't know if you were old enough to remember Eamon Doran's in Temple Bar, but anyway, he was my godfather. He was just an Irish guy that my dad befriended in New York, but he was my godfather. And his brother was a Holy Ghost father. So... They got me into Black Rock for one year to try to save me because I was fucking up again. So they got me into Black Rock College, which is definitely a, a class jump. Like, you know, but the thing was that in Ireland, Black Rock College was so expensive, but actually in America, it just didn't seem that expensive. It was just a time where like things have changed since Ireland's economic power is, a, you know, like Celtic it, Tiger. They're more, yeah, they're more like together price wise. But anyway, long story short, I did go to Black Rock for you. I have to admit that to you guys because we've been we've been bonding here on a level that suggests that we're the same, but I, I am better than you. And, and I, so I needed that to be established. But anyway, I, I repeated my leaving in, in Black Rock, and then I went to UCC. 
Yeah. Uh, but to be honest, my first year in UCC was my final washout year. That's when I started like uh, experimenting with other shit. And I didn't last. Like, I, like it's funny because I ended up in recovery, but like I was such a pussy. Like I was done with booze by 17. I started ba doing most of my drugs from 18 to 19. I didn't last a year. I was an absolute... These days, you would say my mental health absolutely collapsed, but we didn't talk about mental health back then. It definitely was just back like, then, definitely. Yeah, yeah, it was just like, you know, I couldn't handle the fucking the ease and the speed. I didn't have access to a lot of jobs. I was very lucky because I was such a fucking pussy and I was in a world that like, you know, was just like, you didn't get... There was nobody doing coke. It was very different in those days. Yeah. I never saw heroin. So I just fucking did whatever I could get my hands on, but I couldn't handle it. I was a fucking... I was a mess. But luckily, you know, I, I kept going back and forth between like slipping and going to meetings... And then I, you know, uh, after that fi that first year in UCC, which I obviously I flunked everything, I I somehow whatever whatever happened, I figured it out, and I I never drank anymore. So oh. while you were in college, you decided to knock everything on the head. First drink year of college, drugs. but then I repeated. Yeah, but like drink and drugs. So at what early twenties you said right, that's it. Nineteen. Nineteen. And yeah. You said none of that for me anymore. Yeah. Which, by the way, is just one little other class argument that I always like to make with people, which is. My parents bailed me out numerous times. They had the ability to bail me out. When I say bail, I, I, I never got in trouble with the law, but I fucked up when I was 14. I flunked out of school. They sent me to another country. I fucked up in that boarding school. They wouldn't have me back. They sent me to an even better fucking boarding school. And then I fucked up in college, and they still financed me to repeat. Now, finally, I did stop drinking and using drugs, and it did seem like I was going to get my life together. But who... Who from your hood gets that many yeah. chances? Not many, actually. So, you know, years ago, I used to argue with people. They'd be like, that's a choice that they made. You know, like with heroin yeah. addicts. They made a choice. Oh, they man. made a choice. I was like, okay, they, that was one bad choice. How many fucking chances did they have? Because it's not about choice. It's about chances. And I had numerous chances. Most kids from your hood only have one chance, maybe two, mm. right? I had a lot of chances. I was very fucking lucky. Some did not even have one chance. So they hardly get a chance. They come out without a chance, yeah. yeah, literally. Yeah. Years ago when I thought I was a rapper, I had a line which was, uh, <laughs> they said he had a choice, but his choices were bad. I'd rather have no choice than the choices he had. That was oh, my line, yo. I tell you, it's not. Like <laughs> that was good. Oh, give was, me that one. That was my line back in the day. Yeah, yeah no, you know, because recovery actually got me very connected with like Irish issues of inequality. So back, I was uh, back in those days when I thought I could be a rapper. I was like obsessed, you know. But when I, I, I think I, that's what I like that about you that you're acknowledging the fact that you came from this place of privilege and you're acknowledging that. You know, I'm not going to judge everyone who's below me because I'm fucking better than them. You're like, no, I actually have better opportunities than these people. And you're bringing attention to the inequality there. And we talked about this before that we had Ardell on, Ardell O'Hanlon. Yeah. And he acknowledged that as well. He's yeah. like, look, I came, I had a great upbringing. I Guess where he went to school? Black Rock College. <laughs> <laughs> but like he, because we're we're in the Illuminati. You yeah. know, I mean, we've allowed you guys to do well, but yeah. you know, it's <laughs> but no, do you know that like he acknowledged the fact that yeah, like I, everything I have is because it was being handed to me. I didn't have to earn. He literally nearly openly said that. Yeah, yeah. and he's yeah. like, do you know what? Well, his dad was a politician, a very successful and a yeah. doctor. Yeah. And he was saying like, this was all handed to me, and this was afforded by my dad. I didn't earn this, and he's like, but he's not pretentious. He's not a snob. He's the most down to earth fella. And that's what I'm saying. That's nice to see that with you as well, because you're acknowledging the fact that look, at, I had numerous chances. That was all my fault that I fucked up. You know yeah. what I mean? And I mean, really. You know, because I'm doing a show about my mom at the moment. It's somewhat critical of my mother at times, but the one thing I have to say about my mother is that really it was an incredible feat of like financial manipulation because we were not wealthy. We did not grow up wealthy, but by sending me to Ireland and by actually getting access to this like really good education at like by American standards, quite low money, she really like, I got a lot more than I even deserved. So I, I was, I had the privilege. Plus I was kind of lucky that my mother was like a little slick that way, mm. you know? She was cute. Yeah, but she was also, you know, it's funny, the Irish-American thing, like, a lot of it has to do with, like, Irish connections, because, you know, she didn't have a great education, but she ended up working for this Irish law firm, so she ended up, like, connected, you know, a lot of it's, a lot of it's luck and connections, yeah. and I, I have to say, 100%, it's, it's a privilege. I mean, we didn't talk about privilege back in the day, but... Yeah, yeah. But in fairness, also, to all my buddies that I got real close with, you know, my first godchild is, is, is from Fatima... And I, I, I lived in Fatima. Like, those connections that I had with those guys, from the, particularly from the early recovery days, like, they also didn't judge me. Like, they accepted me. And to be honest, man, the, the, the gifts that they gave me of, like, learning about that life, but also understanding that humor, understanding that culture, yeah. and being able to turn that into entertainment, 
Like, I, I owe that to them. Yeah. You know? Yeah, That's did mad. you knock? Oh, go on. Sorry, Tarnan. Yeah. Do you remember we were talking on, was it, I can't remember when, but me, you, and me both were talking, and we were trying to explain that, will people understand us, the humor was, like how cutthroat there is, where yeah. we're from, when you slag somebody, it's just like, from the outside looking in, you were like, oh my God, I can't believe you just said that to him. Yeah. I was like, are you afraid? Like, he'd say 10 times worse to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. like humor, like people don't read, like some people dark. don't get it. Yeah. yeah. But I was going to ask you, so did you like, did you go into recovery and knock all that in the head because like you had a huge problem with it and it was fucking you up or just that it was taking you down the wrong road in terms of like with the chances in college and stuff like that? So I know, no, was it like a, a smart I mean, you know, this is not a real problem? Like not a, a real like, problem. I mean, I was suicidal. And it's funny because you know people say people are more free with the word suicidal these days. Yeah, and I would have ne- years ago I wouldn't have said that, and I'm not saying I'm changing my tune now. But, but like, I think it's more acceptable nowadays. Like, yeah, as well, but though. I also didn't even acknowledge it for myself because I remember I, I, I was real that 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 first few months in Cork, I, I was really bad. And nowadays, people would say I was deeply depressed. But like, we did not talk that no. way back then, especially for us. And it, my mother's uh, great uh, gift and also her flaw was that she put everything down to booze and drugs as the problem, right? Mm. Which is sometimes right. But sometimes it's, it's incorrect yeah. in yeah. that I didn't realize that I, I wasn't just booze and drugs. I was fucking deep in what now we would say was depression, but I did not acknowledge it as that. But I remember one time I was struggling. I was blowing all the cash that my mother had given me, drinking all the time, taking fucking ease and just like just miserable. And uh, I called her one day and she was like, what's the matter? I was like, I don't know. I don't fuck. I think I'm going to fucking kill myself. And I hung up the phone and I didn't call her for three days, which is a major fucking asshole yeah. move. But it was like, you know, even when I think back then, like I never once in those early recovery meetings or people say like, why did you come? I never once said like I was suicidal, but I literally fucking suicide. I was in the darkest fucking place, but we didn't talk like that back then. Cause back then it was just like, things are really bad and I need to get clean. And so I just thought of everything as like clean and sober and everything will be all right. That's not just you. But it was Everybody true. was like that. Yeah, but it was it was true. It fucking solved a lot of my problems. Yeah. But there was there was more than just that going on. But the good thing about recovery, certainly for me, was that they didn't just say you need to whip that in the head. They did also say you need to like work on yourself and all that. So I yeah. did end up doing that. But yeah, that shit was pretty dark. And to be honest, man, I was a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. High guy. I was actually talking to my little cousin Liz, you know, she's she's 21. And, uh, you know, I've known her, like, she's more like my niece, I guess, but she lives in my house in, in Rialto. And I was um, I was saying to her that, in a way, I was kind of lucky that I was such a bad drinker that even before I really ever took drugs, I took very limited amount of drugs before I already knew that I had a serious problem with alcohol because every time I fucking drank, I drank till I blacked out, and in a blackout, I would get in bad, violent situations. Yeah. I'm that guy. I'm sure you all know that guy. Yeah. I don't know why I'm that guy. Me. You know, I don't know why I'm that guy. Mm. I to, to the day I die, I don't know why I had that switch in me that would flick. But I had really bad outcomes from from drinking, like yeah. really bad friendships lost, lucky lucky escapes. You know, like bad beatings. And so I I, I kind of knew like it just probably wasn't going to work out. Mm. So I was lucky that I kind of was like knew that I couldn't do this. I'm the exact same, Jan. I used to envy people who could say, do you want to go for a point? And they'd go and have two points and go home. No. Where I'm like, don't ask me to go for a point because there's no such thing as just a point. If you're going to go on the drink, I used to think, why would you just have one point? You're not yeah. going to get anything off it. You're not getting any buzz off yeah, it. That used just to have a glass of coke. As well. Or yeah. if I'm going for a point, let's go and go on a mad one. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, it's funny because I, I, I can remember my first time getting drunk. Even I was 12. It was like 1988. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is why I always say, like, people say, like, how do you know, like, you weren't meant to drink? Because I grew up with an, what now we know is anxiety, right? But we didn't talk about anxiety. Mm. But I grew up with a fucking tension in my body my entire fucking childhood. My mother was a, a very a stressed out, like, very controlling, odd woman. But, you know, you don't know this when you're a kid, but you know that you're fucking stressed all the time. Like, like the way I say, if somebody said, how do you explain your childhood? My childhood was like sitting outside the principal's office every fucking minute of the day. I literally thought I was in trouble every fucking second of my childhood. Like, I never felt free from stress, right? And I just remember the, the obvious thought, because I was looking at a tree on the corner of 47th Avenue, 188th Street. The tree was illuminated by a street light. And I felt the fucking calmness of alcohol descending over me 
And I remember looking at the tree and thinking, finally, I can fucking relax. The healing was too great. How can you fight that? <laughs> like, no, but, finally, yeah. normality for a yeah. fucking second. That's the thing with drinking drugs. Still, there's no point trying to hide it. They do fix it short term, yeah. long term. So it wasn't fuck. meant to be for me. Yeah. I'm trying to break that chain, but pretty sure my kid's going to be fucked up too if I ever have one. <laughs> <laughs> right, so... You wrap up in college, you finish how long, many years? Well, I got, I got, so I, I stopped uh, drinking everything and then I, I, I went back to UCC. Yeah. Uh, but I had to repeat first year. So I basically started with a clean slate. And I didn't even do that great in that, that first year back because, but the difference was I wasn't because of booze and alcohol, it was because I was like obsessed with the recovery. So I really was more like immersed in recovery for that first year. But after that first year, I became a normal student. But actually, in the next year after that, which would have been my third year in UCC, <clears> but my <throat> second year officially as a student, I started doing comedy. Yeah. But all that came from uh, not just stopping drinking, doing drugs, but also uh, the, the connections that I made in recovery. And then also just like the, the freedom of just like, you got to look for something else, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I always loved performance. I was involved in the drama society. And, uh, and then actually uh, somebody in recovery was the one that pushed me to do comedy. So all that happened when I was in UCC. So and you're in your 20s. You started 21. Comedy. I was 21. I was a year yeah. and a half sober. I started doing comedy. Yeah, yeah. Well, can you remember your first gig? Ninety-seven. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking about my first gig when you guys were talking about it. <laughs> yeah, about your first gig. I've never been more nervous in my life. Oh, I so. never understood the term. I nearly shit my pants until my first comic gig. <laughs> I like. I I literally remember thinking, oh, that's what they mean when they said I nearly shit my pants because I literally thought I am not going to be able to not shit my pants. Like the nerves were so fucking strong. <laughs> like they, I, I just. It, this sounds a bit gross, but like I just couldn't shit enough <laughs> like, like, every time i thought it was done i had to go back to the fucking bathroom i was so fucking nervous man yeah and i had to do 20 minutes too because they didn't really understand like open mics for, at this particular place oh god I, I just my overriding memory of that first gig i was, I was fucking so nervous like, so what's that 20 as opposed to 15 minutes is it five usually for your first gig really yeah but it doesn't matter i had whatever I'm, i had a good five minutes in there but i had some waffle but i had so many friends in and it went fucking great that first gig you know it was a lot of energy and then afterwards like i was fucking hooked i mean i was hooked from like 30 seconds into that first show same yeah, which is what you guys felt, right? Because I was yeah. thinking about how I felt when you guys were talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was the exact same. I felt sick. Like, when they were saying, like, five minutes left, I was like, I still would have cancelled. Like, if was I your mouth dry? Left, everything. Yeah. Yeah. Mouth dry, palms went, everything. But the I mean, not even 30 seconds, five seconds being on the stage, I was like, get me a mic. Fuck, yeah. this is lethal. Because once you feel the rush of the crowd, and mm, then you're yeah. in the moment, it's pretty amazing. I do a live show every week, I would now, yeah. after that. It, yeah, then, then, that's, all ever, yeah. <laughs> that's all I ever... That's all I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my whole life <laughs> that's where supposed to be yeah but like we, we said this to him so like I had the plan I had I was like this is how we're going to break it down boom and that's what's going to happen and Terence was still like no it's not like it, blah 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 so I'm talking him off a ledge for that since we announced it before we announced it <laughs> that we're doing a live show I'm literally talking him down off a ledge and that was grand that was grand and then like I remember thinking then I'm not nervous and I wonder why and that's grand but he was and then when we got to go onto the stage we were standing behind the corner in the wings and then I shit myself. I was like, oh, bollocks. <laughs> I hit you then. I hit me then. Everything came in. I was like, you actually haven't got a clue what you're fucking doing. You think you do, but you don't. And then he was buzzing. And I was like, the other side of my head was like, don't let him see you're nervous. And I was like, I won't, I won't. And then he went on stage and he just talked to her like a duck to water. And I was like, grand. And then we got out there and I was like, whoo. But what I said to him was, you're going to go on that stage. And the number one problem we're going to have is we're not going to get you back into the studio. Because yeah. you know what it's like to be on a stage. Then. <laughs> it's the but best you can't thing get the world. you can't get the audience without this. Yeah, yeah true. true. You know what I'm saying? Oh, you, need, you need to feed the. It's unbelievable. You need to you need to get the get the fans. Mm. Ah, it's a great buzz. No, it's unbelievable. You can't yeah. you can't. No drink it. or drug will ever yeah. give you the high that yeah, you'll get yeah. after. I like. I'm still chasing that high. Yeah. yeah. After all these years, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a serious buzz, and it's and it's you'll get better at it too, which is cool, you know, because like yeah. it'll never. You know, some shows will be better than others. Like you'll 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 be on the ups and downs, and sometimes you'll say something fucking stupid. You'll lose the crowd. You know, you'll you'll experience all the all the ups and downs. You'll get better and better at it all the time. You'll start to understand crowd dynamics. You'll understand yeah. like when you know when to calm it down a little bit. You know, you'll yeah. just you'll you'll get better and better at it. But it will always be a great buzz, and there will always be certain nights that are just special. Like I had one Friday night in Clay, and the audience were just Clay County Kill there. The audience were just fucking special, and like it just hit. Some nights will be better, but it is always exciting. 
Like yeah. it is live performance is very exciting. You know what I loved the most, nearly the most about the whole show, not the most, but what I loved the most about was right after. So when we finished the show, we were on such a high, and we just went into the dressing room, left our phones and all in the other one, and us two and our team, our producers and that, just sat down and just took a moment and was Embrace like, it, yeah. fuck yeah. me, man. Yeah. That was like special, do you know what I mean? No, that's like, good that you did that. 14, 15 months ago, we're at the kitchen table, we're a phone talking into it, and then we just sold out a show, people killing each other trying to get tickets, yeah. and blew it out of the park, and then we just sat there and just took a moment, and it was just lethal to watch. Mm. Yeah, that's great. It's a memory yeah. I'll have for life, you know what I mean? Like, regardless of the whole show, just after that moment, I was like, I love it. Yeah, and that's the advice I always give to people. Like, Joanne McNally's blowing up now. I, or I, I say to her, like, take it in. Mm. You know, because the one regret I have is, you know, particularly in those early days when you blow up first and it's so fucking exciting, I really forgot to take it in enough. Yeah. yeah. And I, I don't know if anybody told me or not, but I'm, I'm telling you guys, I hope you yeah, take no. it in because it is special and it'll get bigger and bigger. You shouldn't feel like this is the pinnacle or anything. But you have to try to remember to take yeah. it in because you can get lost in the comments and the, the dramas that will come and the, the pitfalls. I always see me and Hannah, my, my fiance, were joking about it because we were watching the Kanye doc. But we were also saying that like every rapper's first album is like, I'm going to make it to the top. Every, rack is, every rapper's second album is, yo, these fucking haters are coming. <laughs> <It's not> like, <laughs> the haters are coming for you. Just so you know, do yeah. not focus on them. Like everybody, unfortunately, with, with success comes the haters. Ignore the haters, man. It's a tiny, but like, I don't even, like, because we're not controversial, Des. We just come on and have a chat, have a bit of buzz, whatever. Like, people, you get the odd little comment about how can anybody listen to them? Their voices yeah. are annoying. Someone's like, oh, these fellas think they have all the answers. We don't. That's why we have so many different, diverse, and dynamic people in to have conversations with. But, like, yeah. it's like, it's, it's such a small minority, like, but, like, the rest of it is cool for now. Yeah, don't but what I'm saying there. is just, Folk, like literally allow yourself to just be warm in that sense of mm. achievement because it is a real it's a real sense of achievement yeah. it's a great thing that you did but what's even more exciting is that you can do that different parts of Ireland experience that different energy find out you know uh, find out what like a, a, a crowd in Mullingar that doesn't have as much of the same upbringing as you see how they interact you know that all that stuff is going to be super fun and what's really cool about that is it's going to help you to like have more and more experiences to talk about and it's also going to bring on like you know different guests it's just going to broaden out your appeal because yeah. like you will evolve you guys yeah. will naturally evolve you'll grow up you'll mature all these things are going to happen into the mic yeah. that's what's so cool about the podcasting thing is the audience are going to grow with you yeah no it was deadly honestly and what we are like a lot of people are saying talk about or when is it out and all we didn't video it. it, I don't, it was I, an intimate. To be honest, man, I don't think you should put out the lives. I, I don't no. like live pods, and I think the live experience should just be the live experience. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I liked about it. It was very intimate. and and like. Oh, oh we need to address the oak. Oh. Sorry for jumping out. <laughs> the, uh, will I? Yeah. Yeah, the yeah so, so uh, towards the end of the live podcast, the live show, uh, we did a Q&A, right? And we couldn't really hear the questions, because we were on the stage, it's like the speakers are pointing out to the audience, yes. so on the stage was a bit difficult to hear, so anytime someone asked a question, we'd look to the front row and say, what did they say? And they'd tell us, so it was like, Grant, then one question came out, and I was like, well, Tardin said, I shut up, a girl, so, but we didn't hear this, we didn't hear what she said. So we no. just went straight under the fence of like, who the fuck is that? Get yeah. them out of here, shut your mouth. Because we, we didn't hear this, we looked at the front row and he goes, well, Tardin said, I shut up, so we were like, you know where the door is, What's fuck you, Why did you buy a ticket, like, what, what are you doing? Roasting, all right? Turns out she's actually a good friend of mine, she's... <laughs> One of the biggest fans of the podcast, and she was asking a question for Lim Luan, but obviously I was still yapping away. She's like, Will he have a shut up for the last this? It was just a joke. But we just heard, she said, Will he have a shut up? And we butchered her. Yeah. So listen, you know who you're at. I'm not going to say that name, but I'm sorry in any way. Well, this yeah. is what I'm saying. Don't be fucking sensitive, bro. It's going to get a lot worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> you're telling me a second ago, we don't focus on that. Then you tell me you fucking ripped that off. Yeah. But, <laughs> but we know it. But we know it, you know what I mean? And but we didn't, then. We didn't fucking yeah. know that it was yeah. poor, like, yeah. you know? At the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But at the time, we were just on the defensive. We were like, this had been a great night. It was at the very end, and someone was like, well, Terrence, shut up. I was like, what the fuck did you buy? Take it for Obviously, you want to hear Terrence talk. Q&As are great, but you got to control. You know, like, you got to, like, definitely have a set time on the Q&As, and it is actually good to have somebody on the... It's good to have somebody running around with a mic. Yeah, so this is it. So I'm one of these people. I like the systematic approach. I like to know why things are happening and when they're going to happen and how they happen. So that's why I knew the night was going to go the way it did. But there was one moment in it that caught me off guard and I was like, what the fuck is happening? So we walk out, I knew we were going to get like a bleeding roar from the crowd and they were going to erupt and it was going to be great. And 
we had like what three four minutes five minutes where we stood at the front of the stage had a bit of laugh at the crowd and then I was like right we'll get the show on the road we sit down and start the podcast but the crowd had died down and I was like we get the show on the road and once we sat down there's it was like a tsunami from the crowd again. <laughs> a big roar. And I was like, oh my God. Like, this is fucking... Yeah. Someone's going to have to ring Liberty Hall to fix the roof because it was blown off. Like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It was fucking madness. And it's like, things like that you can't plan for. Yeah. And yet yeah. it was like... Takes you back a bit. Like, like oh. <laughs> like, that's, that's something that's you can... It's tangible. Like, I think that's the type of crowd we're always going to bring. Do you get me? Like, Yeah, well, these podcast crowds are very devoted. I've noticed that. Like, they're more... Mm. They're, they're, there's more excitement from the podcast audience. Which is great. Especially our podcast. You're getting a mad cunts listening to this. You yeah. have to be to listen in to In the art of town as well. Great. You're always going to have... Yeah, yeah. There was literally like just down from all the madness. And yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You know you didn't have to be vetted at the door coming in. The yeah. amount of convictions that were in that building on Friday night was unbelievable. Like, like there's back to you. We're going to have to go back to you. Oh, hey, man. Whatever. I'm happy to talk about whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Where were we at with there's there? So there's you would started comedy. I started again. comedy. So I was doing gig. my whole life story again. Yeah, Basically. so where are you from again? <laughs> yeah. So now you you got your first gig, you got the the buzz of that. You were that big, would, would it be fair to say that kind of substituted from the whole you were getting from the drinking drugs? Yeah, man, but it was also like that sense of this was what I was meant to do. Like this, you know, it Porpoise. was very clear from that moment that I was going to be a stand up comic. You know, my dad used to always say in the, in the late days, there used to be a lot of comedy on TV. He was always like, I think you're going to be a comedian. But, you know, like, I didn't take it serious. You know, you actually, mm. imposter syndrome, you don't think that that's something that you could. I never actually thought that would be something that I could do. I almost thought it would be arrogant to think that you could do it, you yeah. know? Uh, and then it happened. And then very quickly, like, I was not just obsessed, but I was actually pretty good at it. You know, some people just natural on stage. I just felt pretty comfortable up there. Uh, and yeah, I, that was it. I fucking moved up. To, I moved up to Dublin the first summer in '97. That's how I ended up living in Fatima because I was living with somebody and they kicked me out. And I, the guys that from uh, one of the guys from Fatima was having some. Anyway, long story short, he he was like, "You can live with me because I could do it a hand." You know, it was kind of like I was help out with the kids and shit. So I kind of like came in as a, like a fucking old pair in the hood. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I was living in fucking S block, Fatima Mansions, fucking late summer 1997. Yeah, Princess Diana died. I was living in Fatima. Yeah, just to give you a sense of time and place, you know. <laughs> and uh, but but I had to go back on a year at UCC. And then 1998, I moved up to Dublin full time. And I was like, you know, from from basically the 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 autumn of 98, I never worked like a real job. But the last non stand up job or the last non entertainment industry job I had was. I was doing promotions for Goodfellas Pizza. Me and Chris O'Dowd, the, 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 comedian. the comic act, yeah. Yeah. Uh, where you had to go around to supermarkets around Ireland as a, like doing tastings, but they wanted actors that were acting like they were like New York guys, like, hey, come here, kid, get over here, try my pizza. So I went all over Ireland like- Just being normal. No, yeah, <laughs> being myself. They were all acting, but I was just like, hey, kid, get over here, try my slice. You like it, it's not too hot. And that was, and I've never done like a non entertainment industry. That was the last normal gig I had. I think that was like 99. So, yeah, I've made a living from comedy. And where, where were you living when you moved back up from Cork when you finished college? You were back I've always lived in Rialto. I, I, I used to stay, I stayed in Fatima for a while, but I kind of overstayed my welcome. Although my godchild was born while I was living there, which is how he ended up being my, my godchild. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I mean, eventually I just lived in Rialto. I've always lived in Rialto, except for like a year and a half, I lived on Rings End Road. Mm. But I bought a place in Rialto in 2005. So I came back when I bought. So I left for about a year and a half, and then I came back when I bought a place uh, in 2005. Yeah. Uh, and they all fucking know that I live there. Even today, fucking one of these kids that I've known since he's like five years old, uh, it was like fucking, all right, dad. You know, he's like fucking, in his, you know, he's like nearly 30 now. And I was the house, thing. he's like, I'm having a kid in fucking six weeks. And I was like, well, yeah, you know, part, part of the neighborhood, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's mad so, that you never shook the accent though. Mm. My accent, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, Sorry. it's probably no, stronger than it used to be. Like, it's probably more, gone back stronger to American because I, my, you know, my mother got, I've, I've spent a lot more time in the States since the end of 2014 because I was like back and forth with my mom and stuff. So I have spent more time in the States. So I feel like it's gone more New York than it had been. But yeah, I mean, I never left America fully in that I, my family were always still there. So it was like, I think if we'd all moved as a family here, it would have been different. But I was always going back for the summer, Christmas. So I was always kind of getting my accent re-New York ride. Yeah. yeah. But Americans sometimes, like if, if we're in New York and like some Irish people come in, Americans notice that my accent kind of changes a bit, but that's not deliberate. That just kind of happens. It happens, yeah. So it's like some sort of like subconscious mirroring that you do, where you know you have a bit of a, a bit of a voice. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I was gonna say. So 
earlier on at start of the episode, you mentioned about going in and doing uh, walks in prisons and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So how does that come about? And then give us some, have you got any mad experiences in there? In the, in the joy. Mm. Uh, well, no, first of all, the, 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 the Mount Joy stuff was just service to the recovery side of things. Right. I mean, it's an anonymity thing, but it was, it was to do with that. So I would go up every Wednesday. I mean, I don't really have any like crazy stories about that. Mm. Uh, I did. I remember the first time I got I got asked to do a gig in Wheatfield Prison. Yeah, good luck. Uh, and my opening joke was, which I think I don't. I don't think it was Willa. Somebody gave me the opening joke, so I walked out on stage and I was like, "I've been waiting to do this gig." First question I have is, "Which one of you motherfuckers has my television?" Right? Yeah. And, then, and then I said, "You know, it's funny because I I did comedy to get laid, but this is the first time that I know I could definitely get laid." <laughs> Oh, <laughs> they were like, oh, yeah, no, yeah, they fucking love all the fucking, you know. And uh, I can't remember the rest of my jokes, but I remember having a good gig in fucking <laughs> Weedfield. And uh, yeah, no, I, I, don't, I don't have any mad experiences I, in. No, the no, from going into the joy, no, like yeah. just it was just great to. Some of them were just there because they would get an hour. Some of them genuinely were trying to keep clean. Yeah, but I never had any issues. Like I never had anybody try to intimidate me. Or, yeah, you no know, partner. they all were sharing. Like they were sharing. You know, people, guys were just. Trying to fucking trying to sort their lives out, you know. Yeah, and then you had the yoke fitting in as well, where you went to different disadvantaged studios all over. Yeah, the Joy in the Hood was a TV show. Fitting in was like the stand-up show, like the kind of stories associated yeah. with it. But a lot of that humor did come from my friendships with all these my guys cunts. from recovery. Yeah, you know, because I wouldn't have had that. But in fairness, when I was in Cork too, when I was in college, my my final two years in Cork, I lived in the Glen. It's a long story, but again, recovery connection. A guy wasn't using his corporation flat. So I used it, but I was like paying his rent. It was fucking nine pounds a week, nine yeah. Irish pounds a week for a flat in the Glen. So actually, my kind of like fucking tough neighborhood humor had started immediately in Cork, you know, where it was just like whatever jokes that I had about like fucking going down to pay the rent, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I, I was elite. I wasn't supposed to be in this corporation flat. So I would always say, I would grab some kid from outside and he'd be like, what are you doing? I was like, I don't know, just fucking act like you're my fucking child. And then I'd come in and I'd be like, here's your fucking rent. You know? <laughs> and then if the kid said anything, I'd be like, you shut the fuck up. You, you're not getting any fucking sweets. And then I'd walk out and he'd be like, yeah, all right. I'd be like, yeah, good. It was pretty believable. Because <laughs> you know? yeah, there wasn't too many fucking kids from UCC. Good. Because that was always my joke. It's like, you know, I would have been caught easier, like going down to my fucking school bag, being like, "All right, guys." Yeah. That was my other joke about like, uh, people always used to say, "How can you do such a good Cork accent?" I was like, "Well, when you live in the Glen and you like to roll a blade, <laughs> if one of the kids are like, who the fuck are you?' You can't turn around and be like, "Oh, sorry, guys, I'm just on my way to college." You have to be like, "Never mind. Who the fuck am I? Who the fuck are you?" <laughs> so that was like, that was a lot of my jokes in the early days. I had, I had a, uh, I had a, a Dolphins Barn version of that too. Of you know like fucking oh, what are you doing? I was like mind your own fucking business, you cunt. So that was all. That was all like my jokes. Like it was all just like living in these tough neighborhood jokes, and it all came from hanging out with those. And guys. what was that experience like though? Because you went to a lot of disadvantaged. You went in Limerick as well. Oh yeah, Joy in the Hood was great. You know? Yeah. I mean, as a TV show, it was okay. Yeah. As an experience, though, it was amazing. I feel I, I never felt like we captured what really went down, mm. particularly in in some spots, you know. Because don't forget that the gig wasn't just. The comedians, the, it was a community in the audience. Yeah. So it was these people performing for uh, their own community, and you know, ideally, they were they were kind of doing jokes. All their stuff wasn't about where they were from, but they were doing jokes that people could relate to. Yeah, you know what I mean. Which I'm sure you guys are experiencing. People appreciate that you're relatable in a way, perhaps that they haven't had too much access yeah. to. Yeah. Other than fucking love hate, like the whole thing is that like <laughs> if you're from your neck of the woods, it's like oh yeah, I really see myself in fucking love hate. But like not everyone's a fucking criminal, you know yeah. what I mean? Like <laughs> like even that in a way is kind of reinforces a stereotype, yeah. right? It's like every time we hear this accent, is, yeah. someone's getting murdered, like you know, yeah. <laughs> like, like sometimes. People People are just having a laugh. So anyway, uh, so the experience was very, was really positive. Like, especially the gigs. The gigs at the end of it were like so much fun. And I have to say, like, I had a lot of fun making these people laugh about their own lives, you mm -hmm. know? Uh, and then the comics, it was like so impressive, especially some, obviously some are better than others. Like not, not everyone is the same level of, of talent or writing ability, but some of the comics, you know, it was, it was, it was very special, the things. The TV show was whatever, you know? Uh, but uh, but I think for for a lot of them the experience was you know like super positive. I mean it was fuck it was it was great for me you know. Uh, but yeah, I can't. It's such a fucking long time ago. It's hard to remember. Yeah, you know, late in seventeen, sixteen. But I also it's funny because I was thinking about this a lot lately, just because like a lot of the 
you know, the kids from Fatima that I knew, they're all like fucking adults. And I, I've been back in Ireland. I've been seeing them. And you're just thinking about time going so fast. And I was, I was just thinking like, wow, I, I, I really wasn't aware of how influenced I was by those people in my stand-up. But then when I think about, I had so much material about uh, inner city areas, not mm -hmm. just fitting in even before that. And so I have to say, I was very influenced by those guys. Mm. I mean, it was also my most popular time. I should have just fucking kept fucking performing <laughs> for the fucking scum like ye. Yeah. Yeah. Fucking, I'd have even more money. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm kidding. But people really appreciated those jokes back in those mm. days. Yeah. You know? Well, at least you were attractive for us coming in anyway. So Here's a the winter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's a true story. So after fitting in, right, I did 41 nights in Vicar Street fitting in. And all that stuff was like fucking, you know, if you saw Join the Hood, Ballymun, you know, we did MTV Cribs, Ballymun. And yeah. your man fucking had a... A console. And I remember one night I fucking lost the crowd because your man was like, it's not a fucking console, it's a fucking angle grinder or vice versa. I can't remember. Yeah. And I, I, like you, I fucking lost it with the guy. I was like, fuck off, you're ruining my fucking show. It was all very intense. But like, I used to get mad crap. And it was fun because it was like an energy to that. But the next thing I did was learn an Irish, right? And I remember those early Irish shows fucking one night this fucking accent comes from the crowd like three quarters of the way through the show and it goes, Enough with the fucking Irish. Yeah, came here for a fucking laugh. Not to go back to fucking skill. Real fucking angry. And I lost the crowd because I started going back and forth with this guy. And they were all like, yeah, fuck off with the fucking Irish. And I was like, oh, okay. I guess I'm losing this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted to talk about, Phil, because you can speak fluent Irish. Well, my Irish is not as good as it once was because I did the Chinese thing afterwards. And I've kind of kept up with that a little better. And actually, like, I don't know, my brain gets a little... My brain gets a little scrambled, but yes, I I did, uh, I did learn Irish. And I I spoke it quite well, and until I went to China, I spoke Irish really well. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened. I learned Chinese, and it fucked up my the Irish part of my brain a little yeah. bit. Uh, it was like an occupation. It was like the Irish language was Tibet, and China just came in and <laughs> occupied it. But uh, I, I uh, a bit controversial, but sure. Look, well, it's historically accurate. Yeah, yeah. well, look, I'm not going to go. Well, we can't we can't pretend that these horrible occupations aren't happening right before our eyes as we speak. So anyway, um, I uh, uh, the Irish thing happened in uh, 2007. But you went over to New York as well. You were tapping into the Irish communities over there. Oh, that was part of the series, yeah. Yeah, how. They speak a fluent and they're not like taught in school and there's fellas in the bar. Because I remember seeing that, that you go into like a random bar and there's like fellas who sitting there having points speaking Irish. And I was like, that's mad because I'm in school. I don't know what they're saying. Yeah, but that, that was the whole, a lot of the, one of the, one of the things we wanted to get across with, in the name of the father is, uh, was that uh, the language is not actually a difficult language and it would, it, it could be spoken as the, as a, a spoken language in Ireland if it was taught correctly, but it's but, not. Yeah. I had this and, conversation with me teacher. And he was from Galway, and I was like, "This is bollocks!" Because how the fuck am I going through what twelve or thirteen years of school? I don't transition yet. Yeah, so twelve or thirteen years of school, and I'm finishing in a few weeks, and I can't speak any Irish, but I don't about three years of French, and I can string a few sentences together. And he goes, "I completely agree with you. It's been taught wrong. They need to change the curriculum." He goes, "But yeah, leaving cert is in two weeks, so it's the wrong." Uh, yeah, and that's the thing. It's geared towards like, examination. Yeah, no, but, uh, yeah, language is actually. It's not ideally taught with examination in mind because, you know, it's it's quite hard to like, you know, put a put a score on your ability to communicate other than testing your grammar and different things that actually like aren't as important as people think. In fact, like the more you speak it, the more that happens naturally, but they mm. don't they don't teach it through speaking. Yeah. I I say, but yeah, at the time, but this was my big issue at the time, but I said that if in primary school if the Irish class was always just cartoons every single class, 30 minutes of cartoons, 15 minutes of vocabulary from that episode, and then everyone's homework was to go home and just memorize those words and then come in and watch a cartoon and talk about it, that actually would be better than the bullshit curriculum that they have. Because I used to sit down every morning and watch the fucking T.G. Cahar children's cartoons, and the Irish was quite basic, Dora the Explorer and fucking Wonder Pets. Mm. <laughs> you know, I used to watch fucking Wonder Pets mm. and, uh, you know, fucking Dora the Explorer. It's Miss Shemappa. It's Miss Shemappa. Miss Shemappa. <laughs> that's, that's how I learned fucking Irish. Yeah. You know, somebody had give me the advice, like watch kids' shows because that'll be the level of language that you can take in, you know? So listen, everybody in Ireland could speak decent Irish if they, if they changed the way that it was taught. Because the amount of time that's given over to Irish, the results should be way better. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And, and sadly, unfortunately, not only is it a bad result, it's also a worse result because everyone's actually left with a bit of a resentment. Exactly. A bit of yeah. a chip on their shoulder yeah. about the land. Not everybody, but a huge percentage. A lot of people resent the Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But those, were... listen, those people in the States speak it. They have motivations, you know, cultural, uh, you know, the, 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 the motivations are, are, are almost more important. 
Uh, and unfortunately for most uh, children in Ireland, they're taught literally for results, and it's not really a great motivation, mm. you know? So it, it is what it is. I mean, that was a great time in my life. That was like a life-changing experience. The language learning in Connemara, I fucking loved it, and it made me feel more Irish to be able to speak the language. So the other great thing about language is you realize that, you know, it's a real connector to a culture. It makes yeah. you, you know, like that's the things like, what is different about Spanish people? Yeah. Number one is that fucking speak a different language, and that was what's cool about Ireland. It's like, oh, am I more Irish because I can speak the language? I mean, I would think so personally, but not yeah. everyone agrees with that. But I felt that in my soul because at that stage, I've been in Ireland a long time. People kept telling me I wasn't Irish, which kind of like fucking hurt me. I was a little yeah. hurt. Like, was that like your little fuck you? Like, oh, I'm not Irish. Oh, yeah, I'm Will Callaghan, Doug Well, well I, that, the joke in the show was uh, the great thing about speaking Irish is when somebody tells me I'm not Irish, that I can tell them in a language that they don't understand proves that I fucking am. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, no, it's not 100% true. It's just a fucking joke. And why did you want to learn Chinese then? Uh, that was just a personal, that was just a personal desire uh, that I'd built up for many, many years that kind of evolved a little bit out of the Irish language idea, although it took five years for it to happen. Five um, years and you can speak fluent Chinese? No, then. no, no. It took five years for that series to happen. Right. No, I spoke fluent Chinese after a year. Same with the Irish a year, Chinese a year. But that was just again another television idea. But that came about from that was just I you know, that was just something I thought would be cool. You know, I thought it was a good idea. Yeah. You and know? can you speak yeah, Chinese is great. My yeah. Chinese is way better than my Irish. Yeah. yeah. Give us a sense. Uh, uh, so I don't know if you want to wind me up, but you actually. I literally said, saying. if you want to speak Chinese, we can speak Chinese. But the problem is, when I speak Chinese, you don't understand. Class. That's <laughs> that what I said. That's what I said, man. <laughs> and you can you can get a Chinese listener to to verify what I said. We have a lot of we have a, Asians yeah. listening we have, to the podcast. People. We oh, really do. do. We yeah. really do. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's Democratic funny because a lot of them. So one of the reasons why I wanted to go to China was I made deep connection with uh, Chinese people. The first series I made was about minimum wage jobs, right? Yeah. Special work experience. And uh, the, the relationship with particularly Leo from that show was the real thing that connected me to China. I had gone to visit him in 2004 after we filmed. And that's when I really understood that China was a very fascinating place. And I really wanted to do something about China. So he, he was really a, a lot of the reason why also, you know. So yeah. a lot, it's funny, like a lot of the... Because all the things that I've done on Irish television largely have been about immersing myself in a situation, uh, the inspiration that came from that immersion has also inspired uh, future things that I did. So really, uh, you know, I've, it's, it's, it's odd because my career, everything I've done has been quite personal, but everything has also led to other things. So my relationship with Leo, which was just random, he just happened to be working in Abracababra in Waterford in 2003. That would eventually lead to me going to China in 2013, 10 years later. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Life goes full time. Yeah, and now that that you know that documentary was also life changing, and it actually kind of like broadened my it broadened my it made me realize that I, I wanted to do stuff more than just in Ireland, but not like in a way of turning my back on Ireland, but just going like, wow, I have a lot I have a lot more to say. Yeah, so that was China. What you're walking on now? Is you're doing a show now about your ma? Well, my mother died 2019. Sorry to hear. It's all right. I did a show about my dad too, so he died 2011. I'm the, I'm, the, I'm the dead parent guy. Yes, the uh, orphan. Uh, I'm an adult orphan. <laughs> did you? <laughs> adult or What did you say? He just said the orphan. Yeah, the um, adult orphan. Yeah. That, that was, somebody said that to me straight away after my mom died. Like, oh, you're an adult <laughs> orphan now. Mm -hmm. you know, you're in the club. So, uh, yeah. Well, you know what happened is my mother died and uh, I, I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't going to, I wasn't planning on doing a show about my mother, but I actually had to go. I, I was doing the Melbourne Comedy Festival literally like a week after my mom died. And I should have canceled it, but I didn't. Uh, and then I, I don't know, I didn't mean to, but I just got on stage that first night and I was like, my mom died. And then 45 minutes later, I stopped talking about the last week of my life. Mm. So I was like, oh, I guess there's some fucking jokes in that. So then, then I, I committed to it. So now, but then I wrote a show about my mother, me and mama. And uh, I was, I just began it when the fucking pandemic hit. So now two years later, I'm still fucking going on about it. I prefer to be, I, I, yeah. I, I kind of like don't want to be getting into it. I was like, yeah, my mom's been dead a while now, trying to get on my fucking life. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's going great. It's going great. I mean, it's, it's, it's very funny, but it's a little bit, it's a little bit more theatrical. It's a little bit more of a, uh, it's, it's a little more artistic, you yeah. know? Uh, and uh, so it's going well, but it's, it takes a lot out of me every night, I have to say. What, where does that idea come from? Like, so what, my mom dying? That it way. comes from the unfortunate <laughs> cycle of human life. It comes from the fact that we're all going to die. 
It comes from the fact that all humans die one day. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. I'm joking. Around. No, come on. I'm kidding. Man. Are you hoot? Are you hoot? <laughs> oh, right. No, the idea, so obviously. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm kidding. Right. You're saying like the idea to take something like that and make it into a, a comedy? Yes, yeah, so obviously it started with a yeah, so yeah. Is it a comedy? Is it like you were going out and you're telling jokes like, oh, so I grew up in New York, my mom done this and then she done that and then there's a joke in there. So, so actually, to be honest, the journey of thinking that there's humor in these stories about like my parents' illness and death. So my dad had a fucking horrible childhood. Like horrific. His mother was paranoid schizophrenic. She she bet him so badly that she ended up being imprisoned for child, child cruelty. My father was raised in foster care. And um, so we, I didn't know that about him growing up. But what I did know was that he was actually like a physical fitness was his career. And then he broke his back on a trampoline and he was forced to find a new career. But he got into modeling and acting, a very good looking guy. And Skipped a generation then. <laughs> it's funny because I have a skipping generation joke in the show, but that was very good. So, uh, but he, I'll tell you one thing, all joking aside, he was definitely better looking than me, which in, in the show that I did about my dad, I did make a joke about the fact that my father was definitely better looking than me. I mean, I know I'm a decent looking guy, but my dad was like fucking exceptional, like male model. So in, he wasn't considered very seriously, but in the hunt for a new James Bond after Sean Connery, uh, for the next Bond film, which at that time was on Her Majesty's Secret Service, my father did have like a, a chat with the producers. They had seen him in a play in, uh, it was actually an Irish play, John B. Keane's Sive in London. They had seen him in this play and they asked if they could, you know, talk to him. That's uh, you know, so he was, and they were looking at male models and George Lazenby, the guy that got it, was also in my father's agency. So no, he wasn't too many degrees of separation from, from the search. So it's very Bond. believable. Now, when I did the show, some people went in and like they didn't find my dad as somebody who's seriously considered, which is 100% true. He just was like looked at. So anyway, I had for years, I wanted to like do like a, not a funny show, but like a theatrical show about this journey from a man that had this like horrific childhood, but survived all that. Never felt sorry for himself because that was his whole bag. My dad's whole thing was like, you got to fucking get on with it, you know? And, uh, he, he broke his back, became a model and an actor, was quite successful for a while, you know, particularly as a model. Honestly, he was a very successful model, made really good money, met my mother, and then had me, and in the sort of economic insecurity of 1976, 1977, the oil crisis, funny enough, things that seem similar now, you know, they affected my parents financially, and he gave all that up, all his dreams, because he wanted to be a performer. My father, like, he gave it all up and got into retail to give us a stable life, and he lived with a lot of regret. You know, he, you could tell that there were times where he felt like he, he hadn't fulfilled his dreams. You know, it's funny. We're sitting here talking about imposter syndrome. Like, my dad probably gave into that maybe, but, but it was a sacrifice for us because he didn't want us to grow up in an unstable life, the life mm. of an actor and a model. And he gave all that up for us. And then I became a comedian. And my father got terminal diagnosis of lung cancer in 2009. And for a long time, I couldn't figure out because I wanted to do this show about the heroic survival of my father's childhood against the sort of like shallow sort of sadness that he had that he could have been James Bond or he could have been a contender, you know, that he had had this sense that he was unfulfilled, that that was so, you know, so uh, sh small, so un unimportant compared to the real uh, heroic thing of not hitting us, not yeah. giving us the horrific childhood that he had. And, you know, despite the fact that I had my own issues as a kid, that, like, really, he, he was a great dad and a great man, and he made all those sacrifices for us. And in the end, I was able to carry the torch for him. Uh, I wanted to do that in a show, but when he got ill, when he got sick, that's when I just was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking do this show because I'm going to make this show about when it all comes full circle that he gets one more chance to be on stage. So the, my dad was nearly James Bond was a show about fatherhood, father-son relationships, and the the transition from becoming the parent of your parents. Now, I know you have a, like a younger listenership, but I'm sure there's at least some that would identify with that moment where suddenly you realize that now your job is to look after your parents. And in the show, I, I wanted to make that transition very clearly because it's a turning point that a lot of people will identify with. It's like a, a coming of age moment, a moment where you realize that like things are not the same. And, you know, I really had to look after him, particularly because with his illness and just to be there for him, like emotionally to realize that like his life now had like a timeline, like a real one. He's stage four lung cancer. My mother's journey was different. So 
I, I did the show and you know made fun of him, but it was all very sort of heroic. But in Edinburgh, 2010, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, the audience didn't know that I, I, he was there. So I would do the whole show and there was all images on the screen. And then at the end, I would point at the screen and be like, my dad, I think they, 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 were, they would be expecting like a picture of my dad. And he would fucking walk out, bald head, chemoed up, but he'd be in a tuxedo. And the place would go fucking crazy every night, you know? Mm. And it was Edinburgh too. It wasn't like my Irish fans. He was yeah. like random Edinburgh Fringe Festival fans. And they would go crazy every night. And uh, his line, which I made him say, even though he was shitty at lines, I wasn't surprised he didn't make it as an actor because he <laughs> never got his fucking lines right. But uh, the lines, uh, the line was, um, uh, you know, uh, if, I think of my, if I think of my life as a stand-up gig, then this would be a great fucking closer. <laughs> and he was like, do I have to say fuck? I was like, you say fuck, okay? It's in the script. And uh, so uh, anyway, it was, a, it, was a great, it was a great moment for us. And it was just a nice thing for our family because it was kind of like a project that we did together, yeah. even though my dad was dying. And he still got his moment on, in the spotlight though. He got his moment in the spotlight, but also like we had that moment together, me and him, to perform. Like yeah. We've never had that. Mm. You know what I mean? And but we did also we made a documentary about it. So we made a documentary about his life and this experience of of doing the show. And this is a sad thing; it probably make me cry. But when he uh, the documentary came out on a Thursday uh, on Irish TV on RT One, went mm. down fucking great. Like it just was. It really Pat Comer he did a good job. Uh, and he died on the Tuesday, but he was still conscious enough to know. So. I was in the opera house in Cork. You know, my dad, he considered himself a Cork man. So I was on the opera house in Cork when I got the call to say that you got to come home. You know, so I was at, like, I was doing a run. So I finished the run and then I flew back. I got there on the Monday, I think. I got there the day before he died, I think. Or possibly maybe two days before. But uh, when I walked into the room, he said, we did it, man. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking kills me mm. every time. <laughs> We did it, man. Uh. Like, it mattered to him. It mattered to him. You know what I mean? He was a fucking ham like his son. So it mattered that he got a bit of notoriety at the end. So that was great. Mm. Death is sad, but the one thing... I, I did write a book. I mean, I really took everything I could out of my father's death. <laughs> I, wrote, mm. I wrote a book about it, too. But the opening line was, the best thing about cancer is time. You know, like, people die suddenly. It's, it's, it's sadder to me because you don't get that time to get it right and my dad was given this fucking diagnosis but it gave us time to like make the most of mm. what was left not everyone's as lucky as us not everyone has a dad that wants to perform and make documentaries but he wanted to mm. he loved it if you have a if you're bored one day it's not on youtube unfortunately because they, they, they're very protective over the james bond music so rte when you put it on rte they have a blanket right to use the music but outside of that so it's actually i can't put it up on youtube they always they always silence it yeah so it's hard to find that documentary, but if you can find it somewhere, uh, it's uh, you can see that this motherfucker is happy to be in front of the camera. Like this guy loved it. He wanted yeah. to. He missed that for all those years. Mm. So it was great that he got that at the end. What's it called? This. My dad was nearly James Bond. Uh, it's a documentary as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's all three of them. Yeah. The, all three formats. <laughs> Deadly. Because I was on Tommy Tanner and he was joking about the, you know, we talk about, I did a show about my mom. He's like, you just about your dad too. Yeah. Like, you must have cousins being like, hey, fucking when I die, can you shut the fuck up? <laughs> 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 so, anyway, uh, so in terms of like, you asked this question, which I say, I, I ignorantly made fun of yeah, you about. Yeah, you did, yeah. How does that come about? <laughs> um, it, it wasn't the first time. But the thing about my dad's show was that that was a thought that I had for a long time. I had this concept of my dad was Nanny James Bond for a long time. It was only his his illness kind of like made me understand how that would happen. Mm -hmm. With my mom, I really never thought I would do a show about my mother. That was actually the joke because my mother and I, our relationship was much more complicated. My mother was like, like she was a, a more difficult individual, uh, you know, and uh, she obviously didn't have this like very simple backstory that my father had. So... I would always joke about my mother. She'd be like, am I going to get a show? And I'd be like, ma, you, you fucking, maybe if I do like a horror. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually after she died, uh, it was, uh, it was actually more, for me, it's more interesting. For me, it's actually a better show because uh, our relationship was more important. My dad was a great guy, but in, in, the, in, the, in the show, I say, the joke in the show, I say is, you know, I say my dad died in 2011. It was very sad, but we realized, it wasn't long after he died that we realized, wow, 
he did fuck all. <laughs> like he did nothing. <laughs> you know, like like you know, everything worked the same after me. You just miss him being around, but like nothing changed. You know, we we all had our same tasks. He did nothing. Uh, you know, my mother my mother was the boss. You know, for positive and negatively, my mother was the boss. So it's the more important relationship for me. So it was a more difficult show to write, and it was a, a show that took me a lot longer to to figure out because these shows about more difficult subject matter are more difficult to put together. You got to get the peaks and the troughs correct. Yeah. You got to you want the emotion to be in there cuz you want it to be authentic. It's a show about your fucking losing your mother. That cannot be funny all the time because it's not always funny. It's fucking sad, you know? So you want the sadness to be in there, but you don't want it to get lost in the sadness. So it can take time to get that balance right. Uh so everything about it was more difficult. The grief was tougher for me with my mother uh, and and but but I think that in the end Show wise, just in relation to this question you asked me about fucking three years ago, since I've been fucking talking nonstop now for like an hour and a half. Uh, show wise, I think it ended up being a, a better show, or certainly like, uh, like like a more meaningful show, like like a show that has more in it, you know. But it's also my second go at grief, and also the show about my dad wasn't really about my dad dying; it was about coming to the end of my dad's life. Whereas this show is about my mother dying, and it's also about the legacy of trauma that comes from the upbringing that my mother had, which was also difficult, not, not as, not as obviously difficult as my father's, but difficult in its own way with alcoholism and mental illness and, uh, things that are in the show. So I, I do a lot of humor about the legacy of trauma in our family, but I don't hide from how serious it is. I just, I, in, I intersperse it with, mm. with jokes. And then obviously the latter parts are really about death and about grief and they are funny at times, but also quite sad. How did your mom die, if you don't mind me asking? So it's, it's, it's a very interesting question because we don't really know exactly what killed her. She had so many things wrong with her that in the end, the thing that kind of caused her to be bedridden was her osteoporosis was so bad that like the bottom of her spine kind of collapsed, basically, like kind of gave up, like disintegrated. So she was in like agonizing pain for like three, three and a half weeks. And she just kept getting infections and probably pneumonia was what killed her, but she would get it pneumonia or some other infection we take her to the hospital she's full of painkillers for the pain she would full of antibiotics she would heal from that come home get sick again and go back and it's funny i was in boston i was doing boss i was in the middle of an irish tour but i had booked a date in boston so i actually came back i was back and forth a lot and all that time my mother was sick but i came back and i had a weekend in boston the wednesday before we put my mother into this fucking rehab she thought it was a nursing home she went fucking mental <laughs> fucking it was the most one of the most stressful days of my life. She said, get me out of here. I am not staying here. But I guess she was more aware that she was dying than we were. She was like a fucking beast. So we had to get her out of there. But she wasn't fucking ready to be home. So she was home fucking 24 hours. She was back in the hospital. So I was up in Boston. And uh, something happened. I can't remember something happened. But I flew back. I had a show Friday night and a show Saturday. I flew back from Boston for the day to go to the hospital to have the conversation with my mother. Are we going to keep coming back to hospitals? Because these hospitals keep her alive with these infections. And she said, I'm going to take my chance at home. I'm sick of coming into the hospital. I'll fight her at home. Uh, we had no idea it would be so quick. I went back. following weekend, I had shows. And I was back a week. I was back a week later in New York. March 18th, I flew back. And she died on March 19th. She, cool. she couldn't fight it off a week. You know, whatever killed her. You know, very quick, actually. Mm. So we didn't have... Her timeline wasn't as obvious. Mm. Yeah. So... So that's how that's how well that's how she died and that's how that that's how that show came about. Yeah, just touching back to what you said about your dad about the the opening line about cancer because it gives you time. So you have both ends of the scale there. You've you've someone who kind of died abruptly, and then you're someone who you knew was on borrowed time. And yeah. Now, in fairness, my mother my mother I wouldn't <clears> put it into the category of because I have a friend actually just the other day her father had a heart attack. I, like, you know, it's just like yeah, one so day you're going to see your dad, next day he's gone. You know. Yeah. So my mother's timeline was so we're in between a kind of heart attack and what happened to my dad in yeah. that like we knew something was up. Yeah. yeah. But it wasn't as obvious. Like even when my mother went, like we were like in the room with my dad for 24 hours, like watching the breathing slow down. Like when my mother was like the day before I was like, you know, asking her questions and, you know, and like that evening she was actually in a lot of pain and she was up like, you know, and then the next morning she was unconscious and then like literally like four hours later she was dead. So it was a little quicker, but we were there actually myself and my two brothers were there. And that's luck. You know, yeah. like a lot of people think like it's very normal. You're just there telling them to go, you know, yeah. like I was there for I'm both of them. It's very lucky. But th so I was grateful to have that. But that is luck. So we were, we were there. My yeah. brother called me in. He was like, something's up. I was like, you're just fucking dying. 
like literally 70 seconds, 60, 80 seconds later, she was gone. Yeah. No, but that's a very mature way of looking at it. You know, like, right. Yeah, you're going to die. You have cancer. It's tragic, but like, let's fucking make the most of what we have here. You know, like that. It's a, it's a mature way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, my mother's was more difficult. My mother just, like, she just didn't have the same, like, freedom as my dad, even though, you know, it was like his illness was kind of worse. She just had more problems. And to be honest, my mother, <laughs> she was such a fucking fighter. Like, you know, the, apparently your parents, like, she wouldn't fucking stop. Like, you know, fucking, yeah. she had cancer surgery. It was cancer that began the process, but cancer surgery. And then she had to fucking go up and down the stairs, do fucking laundry. I was like, Ma, you got to fucking calm down. Then I went back to Ireland. She fucking broke her neck, fell down the stairs, broke her neck. A year later... You, this this will tell you like what my mother was like. So I'm like looking after my mom. I guess it was like 2015, maybe into I think it was 2016, right? And she won't fucking stop. I'm like, ma, everything's good. Like the world's not gonna fall apart apart if you keep if you stop doing laundry. Somebody else gonna fucking do laundry. Somebody else is gonna sweep, <clears> you know? And she complained to my neighbor. She was like, he he shouts at me all the time. And the fucking neighbor came over to me and was like, you gotta go <laughs> easy on your mother. <laughs> You know, I was like, yeah, I didn't see you fucking complaining when she was fucking ripping us to pieces from fucking 1975 to fucking 1990 when I went to Ireland. But anyway, separate story. Yeah. You didn't fucking care when she was fucking treating us like shit. But anyway, uh, she was like, you know, my mother's going around telling her, oh, I'm too hard on her, you know, because I was fucking telling her, my, you got to fucking slow down. Right. So coincidentally enough, I go, I go back to Boston. I was in, but this was before I was here. I was in Boston for shows. I had a show in Boston and then a show in Maine. Right. And. I'm in Maine, so it's like I've been gone for two days. My brother calls me. He's like, did mom tell you? I was like, no. He's like, she's in the hospital. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, she fell and broke her hip. And like, I, I'm the one that's been looking after her, right? So I call her because she has a cell phone. I call her. She's like, hello? I was like, what's going on? She's like, oh, I'm in the hospital. I was like, what happened? She's like, I fell and broke my hip. I was like, yeah, I know. Mike told me. I was like, why didn't you call me? She was like, I didn't want to talk to you. And I said, why? And she said, because you were right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I fucking know. I mean, I'm the same as her. I hate being fucking wrong. But like, that's what I was dealing with the whole time. Like, she'd rather fucking like have other people look after her than turn to me and be like, you were right. I should have fucking slowed down. But it was tough. You know, she had bad osteoporosis every time she fell. She broke her hip. It was who she was. Listen. It's 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 what drove her as a human being. She fucking she had like she had some fucking demons in her her whole life. But in fairness, like she got shit done. She was a real like caretaker, uh, you know, just like very controlling, strong woman. And so it wasn't going to stop just because she was ill. But in the end, uh, her body fucking her body did stop her. And she she calmed down. She in fairness, like she calmed down. She wasn't the worst patient. Now she calmed down quite a bit. And we had good. Yeah, we had some good times towards the end. I mean, it wasn't great like looking after her, but. You know, we had some nice times. And you're running this show now. When uh, I've seen, we've seen some of the feedback on your Instagram. The oh yeah, people always say, "Geez, your show's going really well." It's like, yeah, well, you know, I'm only <laughs> posting the good shit. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you a funny one, right? I'll tell you a funny one. So I'm not going to say where it was, but I had a show and it went great. And you get this like very intense feedback. If you read that feedback, you yeah. can see there's there's something else going on. Like it's a it's a little bit deeper than a normal comedy show, right? And I don't think. You don't have to have lost a parent or you don't have to know about loss. The show is a good show. You go to the show, trust me, you're going to have a laugh. You know what I mean? It's about heavy stuff, but it's pretty funny. And uh, so you get all this positive feedback. And then I get this fucking message. This, this show was fucking awful. I, I don't know why I'm doing that accent, but that's the accent I heard it in. <laughs> this is the accent I heard it in. This show was awful. It should have a health warning. I lost my brother 10 months ago. And this show, I fucking came here to have a laugh, not to fucking cry. I didn't know it was going to be about that. And I, I didn't message her back because, I, you know, I, I just didn't know. But I was like, it's literally a show about a woman dying. Like, what part of the fucking <laughs> dying Memo, woman did show <laughs> did you not understand? You know, like, like this show should have a health warning. It's like, literally, the show is... Des's mother died. This is a show about death and grief and <laughs> loss and complicated relationships. Like, there's nothing in the, in the fucking bio that says this is going to be the easiest laugh you've ever had in your life. This is a show about death. Yeah? The opening of the fucking show, right? The opening of the show, I have a video. The video line goes, uh, this is a show about my mother. She died in March 2019. I know death isn't normally a comedy topic, but spoiler alert, we're all going to die. That's the opening fucking line, right? Like, if that doesn't let you know that this show is going to be unashamedly about death, then I don't know what is. So if that's not a fucking health warning. <laughs> but in fairness, the feedback is overwhelmingly positive. Obviously, there's going to be some people. And to be honest with you, I have sympathies with that woman because 
people experience grief in different ways. Yeah. And to be honest, because she said she lost her brother 10 months ago, there's a certain tragedy to that. I, you know, I mean, I'm not, she could be quite old, but I don't think that she was. So I think that there's probably a, a more difficult journey of grief yeah. that, that she was experiencing. And this show triggered off some very deep emotions for her. And so I understand why she was upset. I, you know, obviously she's directing it at the wrong person because it, you know, she chose to buy the ticket. Well, for the yeah, show about and, yeah, and, you know, it's a show, but yeah, but but what I'm saying is that like I understand how difficult it can be for some mm. people, and I actually I I sympathize slash empathize with her because that journey for her is quite difficult. My my personal opinion would be, and I don't know if I'm correct, that being at a show like that would actually be quite helpful for her, even though she was quite angry at the time. I think over time she might think back and be like, oh, there's a certain amount of understanding. But the overwhelming feedback from people who, like her, have experienced loss, even recent loss, has been, it was just very cathartic to be able to laugh and cry about this thing that I can understand. But the reason why, because I know you guys have a, like a younger listenership, and you probably haven't pondered the loss of your parents as much. You know, like, I, I, I remember that change long before my parents died. I just remember suddenly thinking about, I'm going to lose these people one day didn't happen to me until I feel like I was in my, my 30s, you know? But anyway, uh, that shouldn't be off-putting if they want to come to the show. I'm in Vicar Street, March 18th. That's the beginning of the Dublin shows. Then I'm in various different venues around the city. I still think it's a very funny, good, enjoyable show because my mother was such a character. But, you know, it's about death. I, uh, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna false advertise. Mm -hmm. But it's very funny. And uh, there's a lot of good childhood stuff. And It's funny because you guys are young, right? But did you get hit growing up? Course. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's so funny around. because, like, if you ask most people in my audience, if you ask you, at, at your age, right, you get hit. Most of the time, they say no. But people from like the inner city or like really country people, are like, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it was so normal, though. But that's yeah. bad because I wouldn't hit my child. Yeah, I yeah. know, but like, which is to me, I'm like obviously I got hit, but then I was like, do you hit your child now? I'm like, no, definitely fucking not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. But the, but the joke I say at your age. So you say you were born in when did you say ninety three and twenty eight? Yeah, ninety three. Well, ninety three. What year were you born? Ninety six. But you got hit too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I joke. I say, listen, my mother hit me in the fucking early eighties. It was normal back then. But when your mother hit you, it was abuse. <laughs> 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 the, the vibe had already shifted about corporal punishment by that. You know? <laughs> but anyway, yeah, oh, that's the other joke I say because I have a, I have some hitting stuff in the show, some jokes about that. But the other joke I say is, listen, I because you just said it like I would never hit my kid. Like I know nobody in this crowd would hit their kids, and I know everybody in this crowd is dying to hit their kids. I know you are, because you know, we got hit and we know it fucking works. <laughs> you know? We can't use it, you know. You know you, if it was eighty five, you little fucking. <laughs> but that's that's just a joke. I don't I don't I don't believe in. But I, I don't have kids, so I haven't, I haven't had the opportunity to. Yeah, so yeah. But not hit them. Yeah, yet. So yeah, yeah, that would say that. <laughs> oh. uh -huh. So there's a lot of that shit in it too. So it's really like a lot of the humor in it is about growing up, and then there's also a lot of humor about like funeral homes and church songs and stuff. So there's a lot of very accessible humor, mm. and then every now and then there's some there's some deep stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, relatable because we all have to. And there's a lot it. of stuff about spinning because I got obsessed with I got obsessed with spinning. You know, spinning classes. I got obsessed with the uh, exercise bike classes after my mom died. So I actually do a section of the show on a on a on an exercise bike. Uh, yeah, I don't. What do you mean? I can't tell you what I mean. You have to come and see it. Right. Yeah. You guys well, can be my guest. Oh, yeah, I'm gone. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. I'm salt. Yeah, so basically, the, the, the last section of the show is about grief. So I just wanted to find a, a humorous way to explore grief, you know, and because it, it's hard. Grief is difficult. It's actually very easy to be, it's easy to be funny about funerals because everyone goes to funerals, right? It's easy to be funny about growing up. It's easy to be, uh, you know, to be funny about like relationships with mothers. There's all these universal things. It's very easy to observe universal things. People see them. Oh my God, it's so true. I see myself in that. But grief actually is quite a personal journey. You know, everyone has a different relationship with grief. So it was hard for me to be funny about that. But I wanted to try to cat. I wanted to represent that too. I wanted to represent the emptiness of loss in a way that was funny and entertaining. And I did it on the bike, but you'll have to come and see it. Yeah. So what, 18th of March is Vicar Street. And yeah, then and then I'm else? in Tala, like the 24th or something. I'm in Blanchardstown after that. So the, the Dublin dates are uh, Vicar Street, March 18th, and then Tala, Blanchardstown, Dunleary. And I include the Mermaid Arts Centre in Bray, even though it's in Wicklow. But those are my those are my Dublin dates. Um, where you can get the tickets, take them out? Uh, well, Ticketmaster for Vicar Street, and then the rest of them just go to desbishop.net slash tour dates. All my dates are up there at Des Bishop on Instagram, Des Bishop Five on TikTok. And <laughs> yeah, well, prolific. Man, we need to have a word about that. You're a fully grown man and you're on TikTok. Yeah, bro, that fucking shit is well past, bro. 
What you mean 12 times? Everybody's on fucking TikTok. I'm over 40. TikTok. Hashtag over 40s, motherfucker. Check it out. Yeah. Well, I'm not on TikTok. <laughs> yeah, no. The TikTok has really expanded out. It's particularly in the States. I notice here people still bring up like, oh, you're, you're, you're in your 40s, you're on TikTok. But like in the States, like TikTok is the only... Like everyone's pushing towards TikTok now. Like Instagram's gone. Yeah, but like you're a 40 year old man wanting around Dublin and like a jacket with grey hair. And like, <laughs> oh, hey guys, how's things? And all. You're like, mate, come on. Like, come on, but they have Yeah, man. Well, when I'm 60, I'll be looking at you fucking doing content being like, eh, remember me, motherfucker? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just a fucking great... The thing is, TikTok's a great platform. It it's actually kill, makes you... It? it makes you think in different ways. Like, I, like you, you never stop learning and growing, as we yeah. were joking about before the camera's on, but uh, you never stop evolving creatively. And I, TikTok forces me to think in ways that I never thought about before. Short-form jokes, uh, uh, you know, memifying things, uh, just new ways to use this new technology you know, it's a like, kill, and like, yeah. yeah, and I was, res I resisted it for a while, but then yeah. yesterday I find myself like, uh, you know, finding a sound. The sound was like, no, no. And then I put up the headline, uh, when the Deliveroo says he's making a delivery first before coming to you. And it's like, yeah. I would have never made those types of jokes. Now I'm on fucking TikTok. It's good. It makes you think differently. Yeah. <laughs> You're a madman. But honestly, I still get, the funny thing is I go on TikTok and like nothing's changed because like all these years later, the amount of years I've been living in fucking Ireland, like some of my best videos were always like, uh, how to do a Dublin accent, lesson 46, the letter TH, you know, and like just a simple ass fucking Dublin accent joke. And everyone's like, oh my God, he's so good at the Dublin accent. I'm like, Jesus Christ, all these fucking years <laughs> later. I don't know why I bought, I'm writing fucking shows about me dead ma. All I need to do is fucking just go on and be like, fucking lick me howl. And, oh my God, he's a fucking genius. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Really? I, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Have I you had else to plug this? Oh, I know it's a plug. I mean, listen, man, I just, my podcast, Des Bishop Podcast. Check them out. Uh, I, 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 I have had periods where I haven't been doing it, but I am doing it uh, lately. Yeah. Uh, so if you're, if you're in the mood for something a little different, Des Bishop Podcast. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all, all the, just give me some followers on Instagram. I love followers on Instagram. You've yeah, you know? plenty of followers on Instagram. How many have you got? About 8,000 or something. Yes. Yeah, but like, I, I should Blue have. Blue taking all he I, has. I, 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 the blue yeah. tick fella? Yeah, yeah, blue tick, man. Yeah. But you you guys are ready for a blue tick. You're eligible. Are we? Are, we? are you really not on TikTok? Why are you not on TikTok? We have. I oh, have yeah. oh, yeah. a TikTok account for us. Yeah, probably just, I'm not into but I've never scrolled through TikTok. Oh, People man, say I'm it's addicted to it now, bro. I'm fucking, I'm fucking, I just find it hilarious. But like, I, I just like. Have you got many followers on it? I actually have more followers on TikTok now. Many followers have you got? I have uh, like 80, 80 some. I, I, I have more than my Instagram now. Yeah. But the yeah. thing is that you get lucky, you get one viral and then you and get a load of followers. Like, yeah. 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 So I did a, you know, the Uncut Gems thing was a thing for a couple of yeah. weeks ago. Uncut Gems. Yeah. And uh, so I did a joke, which was because I'm not circumcised. Are you guys circumcised? No. No. Yeah. So it's normal over here. But in the States, it's, it's abnormal. Very weird. Yeah. yeah. But I was, because I was born in fucking London, I didn't get the snip. And so I grew up my whole life with, a, with an odd penis. You know, yeah. Th that's my, my joke at the moment is my name is Desmond, which is a very odd name in America. Yeah. And I was uncircumcised. So when I came to Ireland, I finally felt fucking normal because there's fucking Desmonds <laughs> everywhere and everyone has fucking foreskin. So uh, <laughs> uncut jam. So, you know, when you see this like in porn, it was like, you know, fucking eight inches uncut, you know, yeah. fucking uncut penis. So, uh, so I was like, uh, just so you know, for all the uncircumcised guys out there, from now on, we will refer to our penises as, and then I cut to fucking Julia yeah, Fox going, yeah. Uncut Jabs. <laughs> got got 2.8 million. Yeah. Well, Dumbass fucking joke like that. Yeah. Well, that's you all know? you need. That's the attention spans out there. You know what I mean? At more than 10 seconds, I'm not watching it. Yeah. So yeah. I, I honestly, I, I, TikTok makes me laugh a lot. Like, mm. I see funny shit. Like, there's this kid that comes up on my TikTok a lot. I can't remember his fucking name. Kid from Limerick does these Irish jokes. And his fucking Irish jokes yeah. are really funny. About the Irish language. Sean Boylan or something. Sean Boylan. Yeah, but the, the Irish language show. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. What's the word for? Yeah. What's, and what's the word what's for? The word the for this? And what's the word for this? So then that would be like, fun, 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 fun. Yeah. yeah. But he's funny, you know? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, the ah, there's a few of them come up. They're very funny. Like Darren Conway used to come up a lot on my shit. Now he's in with you guys and yeah. the Go Loud crew. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know he's in the fucking Go But soon you guys are going to have beef. You know, there'll be a documentary about the Go Loud Wars. The few, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone who fucking talk about yeah, Anyway, wars. there's a lot of funny... There's some funny Irish ones that, that come up that I really enjoy. And and then, you know, there's like, obviously, like, stuff about Ukraine comes up. So, like, when, when people say, like, what are you doing on TikTok? It's like, that's like a five... Like, three years ago, you say that. But now, fucking TikTok's great. Like, that's where you get Because the algorithm finds out who you are, and it starts yeah. fucking 
sending you shit. Yeah, yeah. and sends all your information to the yeah, Chinese government. I don't have government. an OnlyFans subscription, but it's certainly trying to fucking get me one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, why do you keep sending me this shit? <laughs> yeah. hmm. right, there's, I think we better wrap this up. Yeah, come on, man. We're fucking here all fucking day. Because it's nearly Wednesday now at this stage. We recorded on a Tuesday. You're here since about five o'clock. It's ten to this nine now. double up, dude. Yeah, we split it up too, partner. But before we wrap it up, I just want to wish good luck to former guests of the podcast and friends of the podcast, Tom O'Carty, Kevin Ajaco, and Mick, Mick Conlon, Conlon yeah. fighting this weekend in Nottingham. So best of luck, boys. We'll see you over there. And that's about it. That's a wrap. Subscribe to this podcast for free on the Go Loud app. What you waiting for? What you back in it? Just a little more. Why are you waiting it now? Fill your body up in. Walk it high and low. When you finish that. The Hip Knocker. Come down. Come down.